So welcome back. So we'll continue here. Um, let's see the targets for those two options. I have figures too. Um, <clears throat> so for the sequential FMRDA, <clears throat> so we have the power balance constraint that basically makes sure that physical and virtual supply balances physical and virtual load and losses. And then <clears throat> we measure positive uncertainty from where the physical and virtual supply clears, and that sets up the flex ramp up requirements. And downward uncertainty from that point down, that sets the flex ramp down requirements. So we have three targets in the FMRDA green, blue, and red, as they're shown here. <coughs> and these are the three equations that we accomplish this in option one, your power balance constraint, your flex ramp up requirement constraint, your flex ramp down requirement constraint. And I also show the shadow prices for these constraints because they're used in settlement for energy, flex ramp up, and flex ramp down. Very simple. Yes. <coughs> Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Can you go back to the picture? Yes. Um, I keep getting confused on this because I, I want to compare it to the flexible ramping up requirement in real time, which, per, which um, procures the need between interval, let's say, T and T plus one, so it's the real ramping requirement plus uncertainty. But this looks like the formulation is just the uncertainty. Can you talk about It's that? only the uncertainty, yes. So the flex ramping product in real time has two components, has the uncertainty component that we procure for with the award, and also has the forecasted movement from binding control to advisory interval. <clears throat> and we need the forecasted movement to have um, the proper settlement of the product in real time, because in real time we don't settle every interval. We only settle for energy the binding interval, and the flex ramp product bridges the binding with the advisory so the forecasted movement is the mechanism to have the correct prices and make whole the resources. The day ahead market, we don't have this problem because we settle every interval of the day ahead market, so we're only concerned about uncertainty. The flexible, um, <clears throat> the forecasted movement equivalent in the day ahead is already compensated by the fact that you pay every energy schedule for every hour. Good question. Thank you. So let's see how this looks in the IFM rack. So we still have the uh, power balance constraint for the financial energy schedules. That doesn't change. Here we have one additional target. We have the reliability energy schedules only for physical resources that meet the demand forecast. And as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> in this option, we separate the capacity product to reliability capacity, which is the capacity that needs to be reserved above, as it's shown here, the physical schedule that clears the, um, the IFM to meet the demand forecast. And this can also be in the opposite direction as reliability capacity down. And then the flex run product, which covers uncertainty, we measure here positive uncertainty from the demand forecast in the day ahead market, which is met by the reliability energy, to bridge the difference between the demand forecast in the day ahead market and the demand forecast in the 15 minute market. So that gives us the flex ramp up target. And similarly from there, negative uncertainty to meet the demand forecast in real time with the expected uh, uncertainty within the confidence interval we we're working on. So <clears throat> it's a little different from the sequential. You have one additional target, that purple line, and you have one additional equation for that, and that's your power balance equation for the reliability and its schedules. I use the term REN for that. And you can see that the reliability energy schedule is basically your financial energy schedule 
plus or minus the reliability capacity up or down. So you can see that in this formulation, we separated a little bit the, the capacity product into two pieces. The product, the capacity that you need to get the demand forecast, which is the reliability capacity, and then the piece that is needed for uncertainty, which is the flex run product. And they're both priced at the same cost, at the cost of the flex ramp bid. Questions? Okay. <clears throat> well, I want you just to keep talking, ideally, because um, I, I get it a little bit, but I, I don't quite fully understand, especially with that last comment, because to me these seem like two products, but not really, especially if it's a single bid for both of them. Um, so is it a cascade? Is it uh, two requirements? How does, can you just keep describing yeah, this, please? It's like taking one capacity and breaking it apart in two pieces that have two different objectives. So one piece is the reliability capacity, where the objective is to add it on top of your financial schedule, up or down, to get to a point that all the reliability energy schedules meet the demand forecast. So this is the difference between the financial and reliability targets. That's the reliability capacity, up and down. And then additionally to that, the remaining capacity is the flex ramp up and down, which cover uncertainty. Now, with the separation of these two um, objectives, what we did here is we provided more freedom, more liberties in the optimization, the combined optimization problem to find an efficient solution without having a very tight coupling between the reliability sub problem and the financial market sub problem. And that led us to an outcome where the prices of one and the other, they have very loose coupling, so you don't have the strong interaction that we have seen with the previous attempt to do that last year. Uh, Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, so I, where I'm getting a little lost, I think, is it sounds like you're going to have one bid for both of them. You will have the bid for the flex ramp product. Flex, flex ramp up and flex ramp down, they will have a bid. All right, and um, we will use that bid to also price the reliability capacity up and down. So there's not going to be an explicit bid for reliability up and down. We will use your flex ramp up bid to price that. I, I'm, I don't quite understand what that means to price it. Is it going to be In the, the shadow fund. price or is it going to be the opportunity cost? It's, uh, there's always an opportunity cost involved with capacity products but you also have an explicit capacity cost through the bid. So what the market will clear, uh, will clear at a price that will be sufficient to pay your capacity price plus your opportunity cost. Um, it's the same like the ancillary services markets, right? Well, so that, your ancillary so services that, have two different bids for your different products. So you, I agree, just you have different bids for like for, um, non-spin and spin because the uh, response obligations are differently different. In this case, if you look at the reliability, uh, our reliability capacity and the flexible up and the flexible ramping up capacity, they in essence have the same obligation. That obligation is to uh, make bids available to the real-time market to cover both your RCU and your FRU. So, and so like we said, there's a, to the extent that there's a cost of being available for redispatch, that cost is the same between the two, whether you're doing RCU or FRU. Yeah, I guess, then why are they separate products? I mean, I understand you have two requirements, but why don't you just have one requirement? Yeah, so this is what we did last year. We tried to do both targets with a single capacity product and that led to a formulation that had very tight coupling between the financial and reliability sub-problems, and that had an outcome where the prices from the reliability sub-problem were overshadowing the prices from the financial market, and we didn't like that outcome. So this provides more flexibility in the uh, optimal solution of this option to solve very loosely, the financials are a problem and the reliability is a problem with two different capacity products 
and now you have prices that mostly refer, uh, reflect the cost of meeting those targets with very little interaction between the two. So you have your financials are problem solved, you have financial prices that, reserve, that reflect the cost of energy plus opportunity capacity cost, and you have your reliability sub problem that is solved, and that has prices that reflect only capacity costs. And we didn't see the reason to have a separate different bid for the reliability capacity than the flex ramp product. Why, what is make, what is, I guess, driving the looseness? Are you saying you're going to have different penalty prices for them? Are you going to put a No, it's the way they're interconnected. Them? So if you see these equations, the um, flex to ramp up product is that blue equation, the third one. That's how it's, it's determined from this equation. Whereas the reliability capacity up is that second equation. So, they don't appear together in one equation, so they can, they can be procured independently. So by separating the product to two pieces, those two pieces can be procured independently to meet those two different targets, and that provides a level of flexibility that allows for a solution that doesn't have a tight coupling between the energy, the financial energy problem, and the reliability energy problem. Interesting. I I'm wondering if, one, how closely, not like math aside, how closely do you want these associated with each other and how do you want to um, set your requirements so it looks like uh, the more valuable product is paid a higher price? Because if you have the same bid and you have these different requirements, I think you would need to be careful to make sure that whatever you're considering the higher quality product, it, that's reflected in the price. And I'm wondering if the way to do that would be to pull that reliability term down um, and actually have a, another equation that allows you to, to co-optimize between the reliability products and the flexibility product, kind of like um, how Ray can count towards spin do a cascade of sorts, because the way you have it set up now, I think you almost have too much flexibility between them, and you're going to flip back and forth between your pricing on your flexibility and your reliability. So we'll let the, the optimal solution find the marginal price for each of these products uh, based on the bids that you have available, so it's an economic solution outcome. Um, but it's by, the same bid. That's the problem. You can't let, you're not letting someone reflect whether they feel one of these products is a different value or not. Essentially, you're co-optimizing the same bid stack to two separate requirements. So yeah. there's no, the opportunity cost to provide either will always be the same for each resource. Right. So as I said earlier, we didn't see the need to value the reliability capacity any way differently than we value flexible ramp up. They're both capacity uh, preserved from the energy market with two distinct objectives, one to be dispatched to meet the demand forecast in the day ahead, and the other to be dispatched potentially in real time to meet any uncertainty on top of that that materializes. So we didn't feel the need to have a different bid price for those two products. Now, the, Does the that matter though, right? Because mm -hmm. whatever your objective is, in the day ahead, you're going to re-optimize and use it however you're going to use it in the real time. Can you well, talk let's more say about that, that? Let's say that the bid price is zero like it is in real time, right? So the differentiator will be the opportunity cost, right? So if you have to reserve flex per ramp up because of the ramp capability, you can only schedule the resource in energy only that high. So that will have a marginal opportunity cost for the flex brown product. Similarly, from the second equation there, you have an opportunity cost for the reliability capacity because if your energy schedule, your financial energy schedule is lower than it needs to be to meet the demand forecast, that difference is a capacity that has an opportunity cost to it. So the bid is an externality here. The bid is how you value the capacity, but even without the bid, even with the zero bid, you still have the optimal solution finding the, the, the appropriate level of what capacity needs to be spoken for which target and values them accordingly at least cost. 
So the capacity price is just an adder to the objective function that says, aside from the opportunity cost that I have for reserving that capacity, I also want an additional fee to make this capacity available. We just don't see the reason why this additional fee needs to be different for reliability capacity and flex ramp capacity. There is no reason in our view to have a difference there. Jeff? Hi, Jeff Spires with PowerX. Uh, I just, I think um, I share some of the, the questions or concerns that Carrie's raising. I mean, so first of all, I, I think we're very supportive of this concept as far as recognizing, like as we were talking about in the morning, you've got uh, the system to be operated reliably, reliably needs some quantity of energy, capacity, flexibility. You're recognizing those different products uh, discreetly and co-optimizing to ensure that you have the right quantity of each uh, and procure it efficiently. Um, just to add a, a comment to the discussion you're just having, one thing that kind of jumped out at me, it was, are you, are you limiting the pool of resources that could potentially contribute to meeting your capacity needs if the only ones that can do that are also willing to provide 15 minute flexibility? Because you could have, and I think that goes back to uh, Paul's comments earlier this morning, uh, you could have slower resources that are contributing reliable capacity to the grid, but aren't actually capable of meeting whatever the specified flexibility needs are. And yeah, so you- yeah, quick. So that's, that's one area and, and that um, I think you, you may wanna consider. And that sort of leads me to um, some of the things we've been thinking about that we just wanted to raise uh, that we think would be worth you thinking through and, and we wanna have the other stakeholders think about this as well is just thinking about the, the, the re how much reliable capacity do you really need? And in our view, the amount of reliability capacity you need should be determined by what is the highest load that you might be expecting. So say, right now, if I look at the, the second formula, you're basically saying we need reliable, reliable capacity to meet the P50 load forecast. And yes, uh, yeah, right? And we're, what we're thinking is that that formula could be modified to say that in the upward direction, the amount of capacity you actually need is more like the P97.5 load forecast. But that's what the flex ramp does. Like well, here, this piece is the P90, and this is the remaining piece to get to the P95. Right. So, but what I'm, what I'm suggesting is increase the reliability capacity requirement to be equal to that top line, but then allow for the flexible ramping up award that you procure to contribute to meeting that need. So in other words, you're not changing the total amount of capacity necessarily that you're procuring, but you're allowing for the market to make uh, more trade-offs between physical energy that can be counted upon, flexible capacity up, or reliability capacity up, so long as the sum of all of those different products is sufficient to meet your load under all but the most unlikely scenarios. I believe this is exactly what we're doing, Jeff. Um, I mean, and this goes back to your first question. Those products, they do have different uh, resource pools. For the flexible ramp product, there's a 15 minute ramp requirement, so only 15 minute resources with energy bids can be awarded flexible ramp. But for the reliability capacity, there is no such a 15 minute requirement. It's just part of your hourly energy schedules. So even hourly intertie schedules could provide reliability capacity. So there's a, by separating the products, you allow a more efficient procurement of these different capacity parts because they have different objectives and different constraints. And, and I, I, I understand that, or I agree with that in concept. I'm just thinking that one, from the discussion earlier about how much flexibility do I really need? And is, is it really right that if I have enough capacity to meet the P50 demand plus flexibility that I've got enough capacity? I may not because my flexibility is based on a 15 minute ramp as we were discussing with the example before. 
but my capacity requirement might be based on the worst interval in the hour. So it gets back to that discussion about defining what the products are. Right. Um, so there's, there's that question, but I think the other is you have an opportunity if you combine these to allow for the market to, rather than just discreetly and always procuring the, the same amount of flex up and flex down, you can have it make trade-offs between reliability capacity and flex. But this can happen here because these are distinct capacities that don't overlap, so your outcome could be a co-optimization of your energy, your reliability up capacity, and your flex plump up. Well, maybe a, a way to put it is rather than procuring a fixed quantity of flexible ramping up. Why do you say fixed? Because you, you've got a constraint that defines how much flexible ramping up you need. Uh, on the requirement, but on the procurement, um, this basically says from every resource, if you add up the awards, you have to meet the requirement. But these awards are controls that can be different. I mean, from one resource, you may get zero flex to ramp up and get it as, as reliability capacity if it's more efficient or the vice versa. Uh, there's no, I, I don't, maybe I'm missing what you're trying to say because this, this is your P95 requirement, right? For uncertainty. So once you meet your uncertainty, all this does is says, if I have a deployment scenario that gets me to the demand forecast in the day ahead market, and I want to have a feasible solution, including transmission constraints, then that reliability energy schedule will do it. So this is your rack schedule today, but this is more flexibly derived because it could be below your energy schedule. Yes, I think what I'm thinking is, and I agree that as far as it, certain resources might be better off providing one product versus another, but you might actually be able to procure the combination of energy, reliability, capacity, and flexibility differently. For example, you might be better off procuring uh, energy from physical resources that can provide flex down with reliability capacity up, and that that would be possible but instead of procuring a fixed quantity of flexible ramping up. But why you say fixed quantity? I'm not, I'm not following that. You mean the, requ the, requirement, the requirement is fixed, right? The re that's, I'm getting on the requirement side that you're predetermining that you must have X quantity of flex up. Because and, that I'm, and that that will be procured no matter what. But there could be opportunities to say, the reality is I would be, it would be more co cost effective than rather than having all flex up. Okay. I actually switch that around and procure additional flex down and more reliability capacity. Okay, I think this is what the, what the disconnect is. So how do we measure the requirement of what we want to procure? It's above the demand forecast or below the demand forecast. So it's not that the flex ramp up includes the reliability capacity that you say, okay, we have to procure it more flexibly. Is again, what is the, what are we trying to do? So we're getting to the demand focus with the reliability capacity and then the flexible ramp takes additional capacity on top of that. So they're complementary, these products. In, a, in the previous formulation that you saw last year, probably you're referring to that, we had all of this from here to be flexible ramp up. But what this did, even this piece that doesn't really need to have 15 minute ramp requirements came into this product and started linking now the, the financial with the uh, reliability sub problems through 15 minute ramp constraints and that made the problem very tight and very expensive to solve, in, expensive in prices, I mean, market wise. Whereas now, you are very flexible to find this capacity because this any resource can provide this with a, with a bid. You don't need 15 minute requirements for this. And the additional capacity that you need for your P95 uncertainty, that is a 15 minute ramp requirement. That's a 15 minute product. So by separating the products, you give more freedom the solution to get you efficiently to what you want to be, which is meeting both targets here, the blue and the purple. And you do it flexibly so that the two sub problems do not interact so tightly, so you don't have the problem that we had before, the reliability sub problem prices were overshadowing the financial pro uh, sub problem. The, here, it's, it's more loose, so you have still meet the requirements, 
but there is more freedom so you don't have the interaction of the prices. Okay, well, I, I think that, um, you know, it would be worth, if you're open to considering some other approaches, we have some ideas. It, it's probably sure. worth taking offline and going through some numerical examples so that yeah. we can have an understanding and make sure we're all on the same page about what the yeah. potential avenues are. Absolutely, and, and that's for, uh, for this reason we also released Excel spreadsheet models for those two approaches so that you can see how practically the results can be achieved and you can see the interactions. Now these are, mind you, toy systems, and, but you can get quite a bit of insight by playing around with them. So if, if there are alternative formulations that they can achieve the, the objectives that we're trying to achieve here, we're all ears. But I, I think the key point here is that from a bid cost, they're the same. But from a clearing standpoint, they're different because the RCU is an hourly ramping product and the uncertainty we want to procure on a 15-minute ramp basis. Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. I, I'm struggling with that statement because if you have different, um, if they're providing different things and they have different performance expectations in real time, to me then they are two different products and you would want to value them differently. The, the prices will come out different between the RCU and the FRU. That's correct. And perhaps your I, but, but desire again, the, to provide either one of those products will be different. If you think about a bid as a, a willingness to provide a product and you're saying that these products will have different obligations in real time, you would want a resource to be able to indicate their differentiating willingness to provide the product. Their obligation is the same. The obligation is, to, as, is a must bid into the real time market. Yeah. For the, for the range that you've been awarded. From the participant's point of view, your obligation is still a master for obligation for both. So you have Flex Brand Product Award, or you have a Reliability Capacity Award, you're, you're paying for that, for that capacity, the I, clearing price. I'm confused, I thought you said one is a 15 minute ramping obligation yes. and one is an hourly ramping obligation. That is true, and that is how it's procured. I would say the, obli the obligation is probably too strong of a term there. What I'm saying is that the amount that you can be awarded is a function of your hourly ramp for RCU, and the amount that you can be awarded for FRU is a function of how much you can ramp in 15 minutes. So you're bidding in the same megawatt. So both of these, are these both price quantity pairs? You have one bid, and then you guys determine the amount of megawatts? So by separating the product, you, you have the ability now to, to handle it at different levels. Flexible ramp is a regional product. Reliability capacity is a nodal product. So reliability capacity is priced at the node. So you may end like up having to buy these like back in real time at different prices? Because that the would be another reason. The prices for these two products will be different. Yeah, because so the they're driven by different. They try to do different things, right? Like they have different targets, different requirements, different characteristics. So Definitely the pricing is different, but that doesn't mean that the bid price has to be different. It does, actually, no, it doesn't. because if your risk of having to buy back a product in real time is there's different. No buyback. There's no buyback. There's no buyback. Is there no pay? There's no pay if you no don't, pay if you don't, if you don't submit bid. offers. If, you, if don't you don't bid, there will be no pay because you didn't make the product available. But once you provide the bid, what do we say for flexible ramp? So, expires in, in FMM, what does it mean? Once you, you meet your must offer obligation by providing a bid for it, your day ahead payment is yours to keep, you did your part. What if it's like AF and you can't reach that ramping range because the, the market takes care of that, make sure that the flex wrap product is deliverable in accordance with all your other commodities that may have been awarded for you. I mean, that's a similar argument to AF, but that's not in reality what occurs. If you're awarded spin and flexible ramp up, these are distinct capacities. Spin is awarded with a 10 minute ramp capability. Flexible ramp up is, is awarded on the 15 minute ramp up capability. And we have a ramp sharing constraint that makes sure that both can be ramped yeah. at the no, same no. time. No, no, what I'm saying is today, for example, in real time, you are, the optimization tries to make sure you can meet your day ahead ancillary service awards. Sometimes, 
you, for whatever reason, you're bidding in completely appropriately, you cannot make your day ahead award. And there are rules as to whether it's no pay or buyback. So I'm just asking, are these products then going to be no pay? Are they buyback? Because I keep hearing different, 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 but you have to bid the same. And there's that's no, really confusing. Yeah, there's, no, there's no buyback, but uh, there is... Uh, there will be no pay in the sense that the product that was awarded has to be available, and it will be available if you supply an energy bid for it. Now, if you have an outage and the product is not available, obviously you can't keep your day ahead payment for something that you didn't provide. Right? Yeah, and again, I think because it's different products, you're now encountering different risks in real time, but we could keep talking about this. But I really feel like you can't just generally make these statements that these are different, they have different requirements, they're going to be priced differently, and then say, by the way, you need to bid the same for them. We, we, that's not what we're saying. What I said, and this is probably the third time I'm saying, we didn't see the need for this to have different bid prices. If you articulate the need, we'll listen to you. I, and I have, I have asked, I think probably every meeting we've talked about FRP, if, if anyone could give me an idea of what the actual costs are to be available for redispatch. I, mean, I think that would be very beneficial to get an idea of what that number is. And the one reason I keep asking for it is that if it's a, if it's a small number, it makes the fact that we're doing some of these deliverability constraints it makes the fact of how we would need what we would need to do to tackle mitigation a lot easier because you could just put a small bid cap on it. So I think, and, and, in, and in providing that information, it would be really interesting to see how submitting bids for RCU is any different cost than submitting bids for FRP. Yeah. Before that, I'm just going to say that I'm going to encourage people to play around with that. Excel solver models uh, that we uh, released because you'll be able to see how the prices are formed for these products and what the interaction is. Then you'll get a little bit of insight. Hey, John, I'm sorry, can you go back? Why are you talking about cost exactly? Are you, are you trying to get at the idea that you, you need to have a specific cost to point to? I mean, it's your willingness to provide products relative to each other, well, regardless of whether you have, I mean. Well, if we design a good market, the incentive should be for you to submit your marginal cost. So I'm just, what's the expectation of what the marginal cost is for providing availability to real time? I'm, That's I'm the problem familiar with maximizing with bid strategy. No, no, I mean, you're, you set up a, a free market and uh, competition should eventually drive you toward marginal cost, but you don't set up a market to obligate marginal cost. No, the market saying, doesn't drive to marginal costs. The, the market incentivizes you to bid your marginal costs. We're not, we're not saying we're requiring you to uh, bid your marginal costs. You're, you're, you're not. But the assumption of the design is that that bids are based on costs, and that we have a market clearing price that gives you know for marginal rents. And so, you know, when we're designing the market, we you know we want to see if there's cost to something, and you know, then that would be the basis for bids. For contrast, today's real-time flex run product, there is no bid for it, there is no capacity bid for it, because we didn't see an opportunity cost for providing that capacity. Now, listening to comments from MSC and discussions that we had about the day ahead variant of the product, there was a strong argument that there are some capacity costs that could materialize. And therefore, we allowed the capacity bid for the flex plan product in the day ahead market. Now, we fail to see the difference between costs for providing flex plan product and reliability capacity. So that's why we said we don't see the need for those two products to have different bid prices. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Grant McDaniel with Wellhead. <clears throat> so, Don, I think one example here, and this may be off base, but you know, when you when you look at a the, the flexible ramping product, you have a expectation that you may be sort of cycling your unit up and down a bit, okay, as opposed to the reliability where you would come up and have one cycle for the event and back down, right? It's kind of an energy ward, <clears throat> and depending upon the technology type. Uh, both within gas-fired and even in energy storage, 
um, that reoccurring cycling cost that you can have in a ramping product, um, you know, that can occur over and over again. So the cost may, your marginal cost may be different. It just depends on your expectation of how many times you may go up and down over some period of time. Uh, in a 15 minute period might be a perfect example. Uh, I could uh, be four times. Uh, but I think the key is in the market, in the real time market, the market's not going to dispatch you differently whether you have an RCU award or an FRP award. Yeah, this, Brad, so I, I, that, that, that doesn't sound to me like a cost of having the capacity available. That sounds to me a, a cost of providing energy, a, a cost of which dispatch. Yeah, it can be covered on the energy. You can cover it then on your energy. You would have to cover it on your energy price if your capacity cost is going to be the same between the two. Yeah, I think a, let, let, I think a simple example where there is a cost is an import. So let's say that there's an imp, someone someone wants someone's got 15 minute import capability and meet uncertainty and they have no day ahead energy schedule at all. Well, what's the rules for participating in the real time market with 15 minute inner ties? You have to show a transmission profile that supports your bid range because we basically limit what you are dispatched scheduled to to the, the transmission profile and the tag you submit prior to the operating hour. So in order to do that the importer would need to procure external transmission to get to our boundary. That is the cost of them being available for redispatch through the 15 minute market. And you'd want them to reflect that in their bid offer to uh, uh, supply this in day ahead. Now take that same import and say that they come, come into real time now and they just did it themselves. Well now that transmission is a complete sunk cost and that's why there's no opportunity, no bidding in, in real time because you've already made yourself available, you already said that you're, you're doing it. But I think that, that and that's why, that's why one another reason why we're trying to procure this in day ahead because I think that's a good example where we would, to get to ensure that we actually have that available, whoever has provided that import and meeting our uncertainty is basically bought transmission to get it all the way to us. Uh, Dan Williams from CES. So, can you just clarify one more time, though, is the, the um, reliability energy only has to be hourly dispatchable, but the um, flexible has to be 15 minutes dispatchable? No, it's the way you procure the product. Flexible ramp is subject to 15 minute ramp capability constraints, whereas the reliability capacity as part of the reliability energy schedule, that's an hourly product. So reliability energy is scheduled hourly, so it's subject to 60 minute ramp capability across hours. So there's a difference there. But, so, so for an inner tie resource then, if you are only hourly dispatchable, you could only sell the reliability energy, but if you're 15 minute, you can sell the flexible ramping? That's right. So think, think about it. Think that naturally going to be priced differently then? It will be there will be different, different prices. What we say is that there's, there's no, not different costs. Yeah. We don't see the need to have a different cost bid in, in, in the structure of, of those two it, products. Uh, will there be a difference in your deliverability considerations between the two then? Um, no, the requirement is to have bids to cover the capacity. The deliverability would try to address it through the constraints in the market. And potentially difference in cost allocation, though, in the quantity for the reliability versus the quantity for the uncertainty? So if you can hold that question for uh, when we are going to discuss the cost allocation, it will become, um, what we're proposing there is that the cost for the reliability energy, uh, because it's upward, to allocate in the same fashion that we propose to allocate the flex ramp up. So you'll see the details there. Yes, we have a question on the phone, and then we'll get back to you. And Maureen, can you uh, open up the line of the person in the queue? Uh, hi, George. This is White Oak from ACE. Can you go to the next slide, slide number 19? Yes. So I think this is still a new formula. I'm still thinking through it, but um, this question that I have to, regarding the second constraint, uh, I know you keep saying this is a capacity constraint, um, but to me it's a combination of the energy and the capacity. So just take an extreme example, say, you know, the energy bids are pretty low and uh, FRP cost or the bid cost are pretty high. I know this scenario may not be realistic, but just for the discussion purpose, 
say this constraint is uh, satisfied or met by only energy schedules. So now the second constraint essentially uh, becomes an energy constraint. Uh, in that case, that no, energy schedule. Yeah, that's not what I said, uh, Wei Zhu. Uh, Wei, um, I said that um, the pricing that drives to the saddle price C that's shown for the second equation is the capacity cost for reliability capacity up and reliability capacity down. So it's the same costs that drive the flex ramp up and flex ramp down. Uh, so we're not using in the objective function the cost of energy to meet that uh, target of the demand forecast in the second equation. So you obviously have both energy and capacity quantities there. Um, it's just that we only price the capacity uh, at the capacity cost. Um, the energy is already priced based on the energy bid in the first equation. So what drives that shadow price for the second constraint is really the capacity price. So it's not uh, you won't see an energy um, bid showing uh, as a shadow price for that constraint. That's what I meant. Okay, but yeah, thank you for that clarification. It makes sense. But between the first constraint and the second constraint, would you be able to know uh, which energy big cost will set the clearing price for, you know, become the marginal for one of the two, or could, uh, could it potentially be marginal for both of them, constraint, the, the two constraints? If the energy schedule, the bid associated with energy schedule become, becomes marginal for both constraints, then do you have two different prices? I mean, is the energy um, schedule will be so, twice? Um, why don't you hold up that until we discuss the settlement? It's not it's paid twice. It's paid for the for the service that it provides. So uh, there is a payment for the energy schedule at the lambda price, the shadow price of the power balance constraint for the uh, financials of problem. And there is a payment for the reliability energy schedule at the shadow price of the second equation. Uh, so, the, for physical resources, the portion of the reliability energy schedule that is financial energy, it gets both prices, the lambda and the C, because it meets two, two objectives simultaneously. Uh, I think that's yeah, what you were alluding to. Right, right. Just that part is not clear to me whether you should compensate compensate the financial energy schedule twice, or is it double counting, or is it the, comp the sum of the two represent the total energy big cost? Yeah, we have to be careful how we articulate this way. So it's not twice. Um, uh, it's paid for doing different things, right? So it's paid the financial energy price for clearing the financial energy market and then it's paid the reliability capacity cost for providing uh, energy to meet the demand forecast, which is a different target. Um, I can give you a parallel with how we settle, let's say, spin today, that if we have a spin requirement at the ancillary service region, and you procure spin from a resource in that region, the spin award meets the regional requirement, but it also meets the system requirement. So it's compensation. It gets the spin price for the region plus the spin price for the system because it meets two objectives simultaneously. You have a similar effect here. Okay, I think that's useful. Another similar but in that analogy, yeah. um, when you move to real time, you don't have the second constraint, or probably you don't have the first constraint. I'm Actually, talking to you. Yes, you don't have the first constraint. In real time, you only have the second constraint. Okay, so in the real because time, you don't, you, don't have, you don't have the two constraints showing up at the same time. Uh, so you got a real time price. Now, 
you know, what the real-time LMP is going to converge to, to the day ahead, which you are expecting the real-time market price will be converging to which price is shown here. So if you say that you have an outcome where a resource is marginal in the day ahead market and it's also marginal in real time, you, what you will see is that the real time price set by this resource at its bid will be the sum of those lambda and C prices from the day ahead market. Okay, then you have an issue probably with the virtual bid, right? Because virtual bid only show up in one of the constraints and supposed to be, you know, converging to the real time price at just that constraint. But you're saying you should expect real time prices to be converging to some combination of the two constraints. Um, so for the audience here, let's make. Um a clarification that uh, I use index I for physical resources and index J for virtual resources. So you can see that the virtual resources participate in the first equation, which is the energy balance, and virtual resources are compensated at the uh, subtle price of that equation, the lambda, whereas physical resources get an additional compensation for the reliability capacity up and down, which is something that only a physical resource can provide. And where this is not different than any other capacity product that we have that only physical resources can provide. So a resource that has an energy schedule and a spin award is paid for its energy schedule and is paid for its spin award. The virtual yeah. energy schedule from a virtual supplier is only paid the energy price, right? So you have, yeah, I, you I, have I, additional I capacity you. prices. That I agree with you that this is so different than the capacity price we have today. But I think the only difference we have here is the energy schedule are getting paid at a capacity price. I don't think that's, uh, we have that today, right? Oh, yes, we that's do. Part that's of that what the rack capacity, if you have a rack award, yeah, if you have a rack award today, what, do you, what are you paid? You're paid a capacity price for that rack award. This is similar to the, rack capacity up payment here. The only difference between the two is that today a rack solution is incremental to the IFM. So you're only paid your reliability capacity for the incremental portion. Whereas here we bring it into the market and we solve them simultaneously. So now the market clearing price applies to your entire reliability energy schedule because you don't solve this in increments, you solve it simultaneously. That's the difference, but you, you have the fundamental element is there today in RAC. But wait, I think, you know, yeah. I think that we're gonna give up on the, unfortunately I'm doing the, a long discussion on pros and cons because I think it's better for you guys to under, everyone to understand this and then we can, the better and then we can come up with those better, but that is one of the one of the potential cons of, of the integrated approach is what does that what what does what is the purpose of virtuals when they're not don't have the same settlement in day ahead as the, the physicals? And I think that's an open question. There are good points, Way, though. This, I mean, uh, you, you're a little bit ahead of the presentation. We're going to discuss this in detail later if time allows us, actually, right now. Uh, we have another question here. Yeah, Andrew here, quick question on slide 18. Is the negative and positive uncertainty, are those the same value? No, because there are different requirements that are coming. The P95 for positive uncertainty and the P95 for negative uncertainty uh, they're driven by different observations historically uh, because these are for different hours of the day. So there are hours in the day that you have a higher requirement for positive uncertainty historically. Right. And there are other hours in the day that you have a higher requirement in the negative direction. So they could be different. Okay. They're calculated differently. In so. And the same goes, I think it's slide 16. It's, it's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly the same. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, George. Jeff Spires with PowerX. Uh, I think the previous discussion we were having with the formulations for the integrated 
uh, uh, proposal was really highlighting one of the, 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 the key elements of that design, which is that uh, physical supply is able to contribute to meeting the capacity needs of the system, whereas virtual supply is able to help uh, meet the energy needs, but it's not contributing capacity. Correct. Um, and and um, I, I think that that's a, a really good element of the design. Uh, one thing that we think that is worthy of more discussion, though, is that we think we need to go beyond just differentiating between physical and virtual and actually differentiate between different uh, physical resources because um, as you know, different physical resources bring different capacity characteristics to the grid. And so it doesn't seem uh, like that's factored in. It seems like basically all physical dispatches, whether they're variable resources, whether they're um, inner tie resources that may not show up in real time, whether they're physical that performs reliably from something that's dispatchable, they're all being treated equally as firm. And that doesn't seem to be appropriate because we know that some of the needs for these capacity uh, procurement in the first place is driven by those other resource types not showing up. And so it seems like we need to find a way to incorporate that sort of in a way that you could uh, compare to the way that contributions to the RA program are segregated by resource type to properly capture the capacity contributions that they're truly making. This, Brad, I, so uh, I'm struggling to understand that because uh, imports, we actually give them a, a credit for the uh, AS that comes with them, where internal generators, we don't. We, you know, we have to procure AS for the internal generators. So we're already differentiating between the, the, the firmness of imports versus the original generator. I, an internal generator. I'm not getting at the nature of the contingency reserve contribution that a, that an import might provide or might not provide. I'm talking more about is that schedule going to show up whatsoever? Basically, the, some of the problems that have been dealt with through the intertie deviations uh, uh, settlement initiative. So, and, and also keep in mind the context of like a uh, regional market, like if in an EDAM where. There could be other frameworks where entities want to import power that, say, on a 15-minute basis or dynamically schedule bear output from another balancing authority. It's not necessarily that they're all going to be of the same firmness for the same hour. And so you might want to have an avenue for those other types of resources to be participating. But in order to do that, I think you need to reflect that some of them bring more capacity than others. So I think the fundamental problem here is that the way we operate our markets, we don't distinguish between transmission firmness on intertie products. We clear a bid from an intertie resource without paying attention to what kind of transmission is behind it. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what you're suggesting, but I, I thought you were suggesting some differentiation on the intertie energy based on transmission product that's going well along with it? I'm yeah, not. If, yeah, elaborate, kind of building on George's question. I think he said something like on the, they should be differentiated on the probability they're going to show up. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Maybe we can get away from the intertie issue because I think it's just, it's just making it more complicated. Let's just talk about a there. A VARA resource doesn't bring the same quantity of reliable capacity as a dispatchable gas plant does. But the formula treats them as being the same. It's interchangeable whether or not you de deploy a VARA or something dispatchable from a capacity perspective. So the, I'm just concerned about the potential complexity of what your argument brings in because if we have to start differentiating the quality of energy uh, being provided by different supply resources will end up having different prices for that energy depending on the differentiation we'll, we'll impose in the market. So you'll have segmentation of the product, which is something that is very problematic. We want to have the same marginal price applied to all 
products of the same type. Is, you well, see what I'm saying? I'm okay. not sure if I fully grasp that, other than I, I think you've already separated the marginal value of energy, recognizing that some resources, particularly virtuals, bring just energy, whereas physical resources bring the concept of capacity through the reliability capacity shadow Correct, price. but that differentiation is only based on the commodities that its resource provides. It doesn't go further into the technology of the particular resource. I mean, you mentioned VERSE. What differentiation you were thinking in terms of VERSE versus a gas plant that you mentioned? It, on the, the capability of that resource to contribute to meeting the reliability capacity requirement. So very similar to the NQC and the RA program where if you dispatch something like a VER or something that is not as dependable as a dispatchable resource, its ability to meet the capacity constraint in your second formula is derated essentially to something that reflects what's actually likely to uh, show up in real time so that basically your capacity that you're counting on to meet load is, is actually going to be there when you need it. Some deliverability factor? Well, well so what if, what if, if I had a VER and what if it came in higher than its day ahead schedule? Should I give it more, more than what it, more reliability, I mean, it did more than what it was supposed to do. And that, would, I, be, that would be an assessment you would have to make in the downward direction. But the, I think he's talking about I, an after, be, after, before the fact assessment. I mean, is, yeah. isn't, isn't one of the objectives here that you're, you're procuring that, but there's also a settlement consequence of what's being done here, and that settlement consequence, if, they're, if the cost allocation is directed towards those resources that are more uncertain, that creates a cost for those resources that they then have to incorporate into energy bids going forward. So, and like, so there'll be some price differentiation depending on how frequently the energy shows up, right? So, Brad, so, so Jeff, I, so like what you're saying is, you know, like at the extreme, you could say, ver, you know, they, they probably can't provide, they, they they likely have some reliability capacity value, but like as an extreme, VERS, you could say they can't provide reliability capacity, just like virtual. So I think you're proposing that they have some contribution, but like an extreme, you just say, well, VERS could get an energy award, but not a reliability capacity or a flexible ramping award. Yeah, in the extreme case, although that isn't what I'm suggesting at all, I think what, what you said is really what I'm, what I'm trying to say is you want to have confidence that you've secured sufficient physical capacity to meet the load and you're recognizing that virtuals aren't contributing to that need, but other resource types also may not be contributing 100% of their day ahead market award towards meeting that because... Right. So. But isn't, isn't that, Jeff, part of the uncertainty requirement or should be reflected in the uncertainty requirement for which we procure specifically the FlexBram product? I mean, Yes, there is variability that comes in with a variable energy resource, but this variability, uh, this variability, uh, variability should be captured in the requirements that we calculate for the flex ground product for which we procure a specific capacity for it. Why should we double count it in this equation that meets the demand forecast? It's already accounted for. I'm afraid we're going to start double counting things. I, I, I agree that you are you are making up for the capacity needs of the VARES through the uncertainty requirement, but the problem is you're then compensating all resources the same, and those charges are being allocated outside of the market solution. Does that really work, especially as you start thinking about now you've got other, you know, if you do end up in an EDAM, you've got other entities that have external resource, external uh, VARES or, uh, non-owned resources in their BAs, is there an avenue for those types of resources to participate in this market, be compensated appropriately for the characteristics they provide, rather than end up in a situation where they're paid the firm price and then the BA in which they reside is the one that's ultimately having to bear that cost and figure out how to allocate that to its customers. So we think that there's some, there's some thinking there in terms of does it make it easier to expand to an EDAM where you've got the right market signals for the different technologies in the, uh, in the market solution? 
Um, I, I see your argument, uh, and Jeff, and we will discuss it, but um, up front, we try to be technology agnostic when we're clearing the markets. Um, we try to handle this with cost allocations, and yes, I agree. Maybe the cost allocation, if it's based on cost causation, that's a, one of our tenets here, will allocate cost to resources that by virtue of their operation and their characteristics, they cause a problem that for which we have to procure something and pay uh, to procure capacity to handle it. Uh, but having that inside the market differentiating the, the products will, I think it will destroy the notion of having a, a market clearing price, a marginal price that every resource should get the same price. If we start differentiating by technology, you'll have a myriad of prices on each node, depending on what um, price goes to which resource based on its operational characteristics. And it's just, uh, you can't operate a market based on marginal cost pricing on this kind of concepts. Dan? Yeah, just to, from having the meeting two days ago on you know carbon pricing, it, just, it feels like we're kind of in a similar case of thinking about different attributes that get tacked along to the different types of generation and finding how to kind of separate those things out and the impact that they have on the grid in different ways. But I can see how it gets extraordinarily complex quickly. Well, I, I kind of want to <clears throat> come up a little bit in elevation here, if I can. Um, the reliability energy, energy product is kind of replacing what we now have as RUC. Correct. It replaces the RUC schedule. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and if you sold standard RA, your capacity price in RUC has to be zero. So is, the capacity, is your capacity price in this going to be zero, or is it what you bid? So we, we, we discussed this a couple of times. On the, on, we don't think that we should have this one of the RA, back to the RA alignment. If you put in the flexible ramping product and you put in this reliability, you shouldn't be, there, there, there is some marginal cost to being available for redispatch, and we want you bidding that amount. And so the fact that, so we would need to, you know, synchronize with the RA rules that, that uh, you know, and, we, and we've signaled this a bunch of times where we said, listen, in 2021, we'd like to not have to remove that rule that you have to bid zero. And when we go to EDAM, we absolutely have to remove that rule to bid zero because we wouldn't want, for instance, ISO RA resources being having to bid zero and then other balancing authority areas bidding some other amount and basically take all your RA as their flex. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification. And by the way, correction to what I said earlier, because you're right, Don, I, I'd forgotten that I'm looking at two different, you know, time functions between the, the two products and my, my marginal cost would be the same because of that. So correction on my part. Okay. Hey, uh, Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, Two questions. Can you uh, talk about how you would bid this in? I asked before, and I think maybe I didn't understand your answer. So, is it a, a price quantity pair? What is the you, you don't offer? need the quantity pair. You just need the price. The quantity is basically implicit in your energy bid. Once you make an energy bid range available to the market, essentially that will be used to um, optimize co-optimize your energy schedule, your flexible ramp product, your reliability capacity product. But I also thought you said your obligation is to economically off RCU and your FRU in real time. Um, the awards, they have to um, go along with an energy bid in real time because they have to be usable and the only way to use that capacity is to be able to schedule it so you need an energy bid for it, yes. So how how do you let's do an example? Wait, no, no, just uh, hold on. I, I would appreciate the example, but I, I'm confused because then how do you allow people to indicate they want to self schedule? Oh, you can still self schedule in real time, but you have to be able to provide an energy bid on top of your self schedule that covers those capacities. If you intend to only self schedule, then essentially you will make the products, those capacity products from the day ahead market unavailable. So I would say that there's a gap here because many resources, as we've talked about today, economically offer into the day ahead and then self-schedule that no. amount, right? And it, it sounds like you don't, these products, you don't want them to self-schedule their amount. So 
So if I'm a resource, I absolutely don't, if I want to just self-schedule my um, day ahead award, I don't want to offer in to these products. So for because this, now you're, right. and you don't want me to offer in either because I'm essentially sure. saying I'm going to be a non-performer. So for these resources, we'll establish an eligibility flag, and if you decide or opt out from participating in those capacity products, set a flag in the master file, and you will never get a flex RAM award. I would say you could do it that way, or you could let people reflect their preferences through a bid, because there's probably a price at which I might be willing to re-economically offer in the real-time market, but there's probably a price that I won't. And so it comes to me the difference between a command and control master file flag and letting people reflect their preferences through their bid. Correct. The second approach is more flexible, but also more complex, but it's, it's a valid argument. Well, my example is going to be if you had a 100 megawatt dead energy schedule, a 10 megawatt RCU schedule, and a 50 megawatt FRU schedule, you would need to show that you have economic bid range from 100 megawatts to 160 megawatts. So you could sell schedule to 100, but then you'd have incremental bids above that. And if you had an FRD award, then you couldn't have like 20 then you could only self-schedule up to 80. Yeah, and I think that's more rare to have someone who's willing to self-schedule and then economically offer. Generally, you either self-schedule to your day ahead or not, but you could actually look at the but, data. But again, that's probably because we aren't compensating people for being available for redispatch. So they're saying, you know, I have a cost to be available for redispatch. It's not being covered. I'm going to take my day ahead schedule and go. Yeah, exactly. It's at a price in which you're willing to be flexible. So, and that price yeah. should that, that bid cost should reflect the marginal cost of you being available for redispatch. Yep, I agree. Bid. Yeah, so I think we're saying the same thing, but using different words. You say there's a price at which I'm willing to be flexible. It's not that I have a a price that I'm willing to just because you know I want to have a price that I'm willing to. It's because you know, the, the economic thinking behind someone being willing to do something or not is, well, you know, if I got to do that, there's a cost to it. So, you know, I think maybe we're talking across each other when we're saying willingness and our price and cost. And that's what we're trying to say. Mark Simon, the Barnville, just to follow up on that real quick. One of the examples, Don, you touched on it earlier, is transmission. And that would contribute to why or how you could come up with a cost for this uh, product. Michelle, we'll take the question on the phone now. Hi, good afternoon. It's Mark Holman. George, I just wanted to come back to the discussion you had with uh, Jeff Spires because I, I think there was a uh, perhaps a bit of a miscommunication or misunderstanding on the technology agnostic uh, comment. I, I think, uh, you know, the, the integrated has got tremendous potential, and I think both you and Jeff described it well in terms of differentiating between physical and virtuals. I think what we're talking about here is continuing to be technology agnostic, but about recognizing the quantity that a resource contributes towards meeting a grid's need. For example, I know that when you're looking at spinning reserve or non-spinning reserve, different resources can have different amounts of capacity that they can contribute towards that. Similarly, when you're looking at flexible ramping up and flexible ramping down, you're looking at ramp rates and recognizing how much quantity can that resource contribute towards that. You may have two 100 megawatt resources, even potentially of the same technology, that can contribute different quantities because they have different ramp rates. And I think the part that that we feel needs to be um, enhanced is that when you're looking at a capacity constraint, which is effectively the second constraint, different resources contribute different quantities of capacity. So it's still very much technology agnostic, but it needs to recognize that uh, just as virtual resources clearly contribute zero megawatts towards a capacity need on the grid. Um, a, a, a gas plant, a firm import energy schedule, if they get a 100 megawatt award, 
that's probably 100 megawatts or thereabouts of capacity contribution. But you do have, particularly in the context of a, you know, a multi-state EDAM, you're going to have not only VARES, but you're going to have transactions between different BAs where you, have, where you may have something significantly less than 100% capacity contribution. Maybe let me just give you an example. If you have a BA, and it could be the CAISO BA, where you have one offer from a capacity resource that is 100 megawatts, and it contributes 100 megawatts towards a, uh, your capacity needs, and you have a VAR, and let's say it's a 100 megawatt VAR offer, but it's only got 30 megawatts that it can contribute towards your capacity, and you're going to have to increase your flexible ramping up or your, art, or, you know, your reliability capacity up because you take the VAR, you need to incorporate that into your dispatch and pricing solution. I think that's the point we're trying to make is that the quantity, that the different resource types contribute towards the capacity on the grid needs to be reflected in the market optimization, the dispatch and pricing, not as an after the fact cost allocation. And I think that's, and we're not, obviously there's some middle ground there between every single resource being different. And I think the, the point in the RA program is a lot of resources, they use the NQC, which is close to nameplate. For VARES, you may have a different capacity contribution for solar, a different one for wind. You may see the same thing on imports, that if you've got a pseudo tied wind or solar import, it's got less than 100% capacity contribution. But if you've got a 100 megawatt wind import that's firm from a BA that's balancing it for you, that may be a 100% capacity contribution. So I think it's recognizing the quantity that the different resources can contribute towards meeting that constraint. So, Mark, if I read well your uh, comment here, are you suggesting, uh, I'm trying to be practical, I'll try to see what exactly you're, you're getting to. Are you suggesting some sort of capacity factor to multiply the schedule think, of resources to reflect? I think something like that, something that's like simple and workable that gets, it, that gets it approximate. But, you know, I think as Jeff pointed out earlier, but we want to continue to talk through these constraints with you and stakeholders because we think this has got tremendous potential, including in the context of an EDAM. Um, and I think the formulas are heading in the right direction. But as an example, really when I think about the grid, and I'll use a numeric example, if you have a 40,000 megawatt load and you think your upper forecast of load is 42,000, putting flexibility aside, you have your, your physical energy resources, your reliability capacity, and your flexible capacity that can all meet towards meeting that 42,000 megawatt upper load forecast. And what we're saying is, is to accurately count the physical resources, the reliability capacity, and the flexible capacity towards that upper capacity limit. And that'll give you a more efficient dispatch and pricing solution that will lower production costs overall. And so I think we want to continue, and I know this is complex and we have to get into the details, on the issue we just talked about, it could be as simple as a capacity contribution factor, and you may find a lot of resources that are at 100% of their award up to nameplate. You may find a different one for solar, a different one for VAR, so they're still getting the appropriate capacity contribution, and you're also including your flexible ramping up towards that capacity need but setting that capacity need at where the CAISO is comfortable is the upward demand. So again, I know I said a lot there, but I think these equations are really important. We really need to get right. I think it's heading in the right direction, and we'd like to continue talking about how these may be modified to get it more accurate and make more efficient trade-offs and dispatches between different choices, particularly in the context of a you know, multi-state, multi-BAA uh, market. Okay, I appreciate, Mark, uh, that statement, and we do indeed need to talk more about these things, but off the top of my head, on what you said about the capacity factor, I see two immediate problems. And first of all, the first problem is uh, what I mentioned to Jeff earlier in our discussion, that this 2,000 megawatt difference between the 42 and 14 year example, which is basically uncertainty, uh, should, in one way or another, internalize the fact that there is uncertainty in the schedules of the resources that are scheduled. So I think we'll have to address 
the possibility of double counting that uncertainty if we also reflect it in the capacity factor. Uh, that's one problem that I see there. The other one is if you have a capacity factor in these equations, uh, then the payment based on the marginal price is not going to be adequate. It won't compensate the resources based on what they bid. It will compensate them according to a capacity factor. That's not how they bid. And if I you do that, they will internalize the capacity factor in their bid. So where is this get, getting? I, I think that's solvable, George. I think that if, if a resource, if you have a 100 megawatt resource that can only provide uh, 10 megawatts of spin, but can provide 100 megawatts of energy, it can put in a bid, be awarded 10 megawatts of spin, be awarded 90 megawatts of energy, and have uh, LMP prices to meet those two different needs, one being an energy, one being SPID, and have those prices consistent with its offer prices. I think this is achievable. I think we just need to continue to talk, um, and, you know, work through your solver. We're looking at developing, uh, you know, working through these equations and seeing if we can modify that to show how it is internally consistent. I do understand, you know, your point that we want to make sure that they're consistent with the offer prices. We do think that's achievable. But in every other context, we don't give resources an award towards meeting a grid's need that is more than we're actually relying on. And as it's currently written, if we give physical resources 100% contribution towards a capacity constraint and then have, through a separate equation, purchasing flexible ramping up to support them, that's not as efficient as properly recognizing the actual capacity they can provide to that constraint and also including the other capacity product you're buying that's not in that constraint, you're flexible ramping up towards meeting that constraint. And I, and I think there is a solution here that, that we believe is more efficient and will make better trade-offs in the dispatch solution and get the pricing more accurate. So I think we're going to need to continue to talk about it. I don't think that this can be solved on this call, and I think it's heading in the right direction, but we want to continue to to effectively do what you've done between virtuals and physicals, just get it a little bit more fine-tuned and accurate so that we make good dispatch and price formation decisions. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, we are open to any proposals that uh, you may come up uh, showing how this can be achieved. And uh, if, you, if you use that Excel solver to modify to uh, bring up your points, uh, sure, um, you're welcome to do that. I appreciate it. Thanks, George. Any other questions we have? Michelle, do we have any other questions in the queue? No more in the queue. Thank you. Let's do a time check. Um, when is uh, Don due? I, I, I'd rather spend more time on this so everyone can... Okay. So this is Don. So we are planning at the next MSC, you know, we try to get into it, but at the next MSC meeting to have a very in-depth discussion of pros and cons. And so I do think it's more valuable than us sort of trying to facilitate some pros and cons discussion right now to make sure that you truly understand how each of these work, and then we can have a very robust discussion at the MSC uh, in like a month or so. All right. So. Let's proceed uh, with the presentation here. We're going to go a little bit in uh, details discussing the additional constraints that we have in these uh, options. And I always show with red in these slides the additional constraints that we have for the second option of the integrated IFM rack. So both approaches, they have unit commitment costs reflected in the objective function. You have incremental energy costs from energy schedules, your ancillary services costs with ancillary services bids. We're introducing the flex, flexible ramp up and down products. Those will have a capacity bid, so that goes also in the objective function. And then in the integrated um, IFM rack, we have additional components in the objective function that bring in the cost of reliability capacity up and reliability capacity down. I'm using notation that is uh, available in the technical papers that we publish. So you can see that we price the reliability capacity up at the flexible ramp up price and the reliability capacity down at the flexible ramp down price. So that's what we discussed earlier. We had a vigorous discussion with Kerry. 
so this is our assumption that we have the same capacity prices. Um, doesn't change the formulation. Um, and we have these constraints here that make sure that the reliability capacity up and reliability capacity down products are always non-negative. So you can either have one or the other at the resource level. You will either have reliability capacity up if your reliability energy schedule clears higher than your IFM energy schedule, or you'll have reliability capacity down if your reliability energy schedule clears lower than your financial energy schedule. What other constraints we have at the resource level? Um, we have capacity constraints that string up all the, all the commodities and make sure that all the commodities are available under the energy bid. These are your capacity constraints. And we formulate the same constraints also for the reliability energy schedules in the second option. So we double them up. The same with the shared ramping constraint. I'm not showing ancillary services awards here. It's only energy and flexible ramp to keep it simple. So basically, these shared ramping constraints make sure that energy and flexible ramp are simultaneously deliverable in terms of the ramp capability. And this is your hourly ramp capability for hourly energy schedules. We also double up these constraints and we formulate them for the reliability energy schedule in the integrated IFM rack. So what the integrated IFM rack does, it formulates the constraints both for the financial energy and the reliability energy. So as I said earlier, we make sure that we get a solution that is deliverable and accurate irrespective of who gets it right, whether it's the market, the financial market clears and meets the demand forecast in FMM or the ISO demand forecast is correct. So it doesn't matter. By doubling up the constraints, we make sure that the solution is feasible with both, okay? Um, let me pause and see if there are any questions on those constraints because the next thing we're going to discuss is settlement and I know there are going to be a lot of questions on that. Michelle, do we have any questions on the phone? No questions at this time. All right. So uh, what you saw before, these constraints, capacity and ramp constraints are not new to our market. We already have them today. So it's just a, an expansion with the IFM rack. We formulate these constraints for the reliability energy schedule as well. So let's go to the uh, settlement, which we got into it a little bit earlier. So all energy products from both physical and virtual resources, they're paid the marginal energy price. That's the shadow price of the financial energy balance. That's lambda. And then you have additional settlement for the flexible ramp up and down at their own marginal prices in both options. And then in the integrated IFM rack option, there is an additional settlement for the reliability energy schedule. So the reliability energy schedule is paid the power balance constraint, the reliability power balance constraint shadow price. So this is an additional uh, payment, and that's a capacity payment because that shadow price, as we said earlier, is driven by the cost of reliability capacity up and reliability capacity down, which are priced at the same cost for flex ramp. So it's a capacity price that drives this settlement. Um, other than that, the same elements that we have today in our day ahead market are still there. Because of losses and congestion, those prices could be different at its location um, and at its region when we're talking about flex ramp, but the price for the reliability energy schedule is no though, could be different at its location. So as a result of the day ahead settlement, you have marginal loss over collection, which is going back to measure demand, and you also collect congestion revenue, which is paid to CRS, so these are not new elements. So the only new element here is the additional capacity payment to the reliability energy schedules, okay? And you can see that in the solver that we released that shows that particular settlement. So 
so George is done. So if the, let's assume that everyone bid zero for FRP, then in order, the, a resource will be uh, sufficient to its energy bid by combining its payment for both the energy, the, the supply, as well as the reliability energy. Yeah. So let's assume that everyone bid FRP at zero, okay? Then I bid an energy bid of $30. I'll be bid sufficient to that $30. You need to combine, add the supply plus the reliability energy. I might get supply at $25 and reliability at $5, but that gets me consistent with my $30 energy offer. So in the example that we released in the spreadsheet, you will see that in some time periods, um, you have the price being set by a virtual resource that is marginal, and you will see that a physical resource that gets that price, it also has an additional uh, capacity payment through the reliability energy schedule. And you will see in some cases that you have to add the two settlements together to see that the resource is made whole. Okay. I just want you to say that one more time. Sorry, I was writing it down. I don't think I captured it accurately. It's, Keep it's, it again, this, Don. it's this particular breakup here? No, I just want Don to say that $25, $5 thing again. <laughs> All right, so I bid $30. Wait, per megawatt hour. Per megawatt hour, that's my energy bid. So Remember, we got it, and we're assuming everyone's bidding FRP for zero, so there's no yeah, interaction yeah. So with that. So you bid in 100 megawatts at $30 per megawatt hour. Right, okay. and so I clear that 100 megawatts. Um, in order, when I look to see whether I've been compensated sufficient with my energy bid, I need to add what I've paid for in this uh, uh, slide, what I'm paid for supply and what I'm paid for liability energy. So you could, for example, be paid $25 for energy and $5 for reliability energy, and that now makes you consistent with your $30 energy offer. Reliability, I thought reliability was a capacity payment. So let's work on this example a little bit, okay? So there's a 100 megawatt bid at $30 from a physical resource, okay? And there's a virtual supply resource, also 100 megawatts. <laughs> but otherwise, I can't show you what he's trying to tell you, <laughs> right? And let's say that virtual resource is bidding at $25, okay? And you have uh, physical demand bids, okay, of let's say 90 megawatts, um, let's say 190 megawatts, okay? Um, so you will get, yes, write them down. Can we use the whiteboard? <laughs> That's a good plan, actually. Now, I don't know how the people in the small room feel about that. They're mocked. You should always take the road and write. Wait, I'm dead in the slide. All right, so we have a physical resource. Put it on your shirt. <laughs> All right, and then just put this on your belt. There. All right. So, can you hear me? All right. No? All right, great. All right, so physical resource, 100 megawatts at $30. All right? Uh, virtual resource, let's say 100 megawatts at $25, okay? Let's say physical demand, 190 megawatts price taker, okay? Where will the energy market clear? You will take the 25 megawatt resource fully, that's the virtual. So you'll have 100 megawatt schedule of the virtual and the 90 megawatt schedule of the physical resource. 
Mm, that doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, no, because then you'll only take. Oh, we can work with that. Well, and then you put in your reliability. Yeah, it will be a little awkward because with 100 megawatt demand, then the only thing that will clear in the financial energy market will be the 100 megawatt virtual schedule, and then you'll have zero. So this is your financial energy schedule. But then in the reliability energy schedule, assuming that the demand is also 100 megawatts, you will take the full 100 megawatts of the physical resource. So the physical resource will have a zero energy schedule and a 100 megawatt reliability energy schedule, okay? So, the marginal price will be set for the energy market by the virtual resource at $25. So that will be the lambda. This resource is $25. Just say it's 100.01, okay? <laughs> okay, so this is... This is the resource that's clear, so it sets the price at $25, okay? I love it when people point out the errors when we're trying to do a simplified example. <laughs> Every single time it bites us. And, and, and just, just to note, she was the one that said, oh, you're doing it more complicated, okay. <laughs> ah, all right, there we go. So, we did, we did it correctly now? All right, okay. So, it, the energy price is set by the virtual resource at $25, and the virtual resource is paid at $25, it's whole, okay? Uh, but now you have the reliability energy schedule that is 100 megawatts for the physical resource to meet the demand forecast, and uh, uh, the price will be an opportunity cost of $5 for what we have there at XC. So, what you'll have, oh no, this should be $30. This should be $30, because the opportunity cost is $30. No? Yeah? Once you take this energy schedule, you have to pay it. This could be marginal for the liability energy. And with zero capacity still, you should pay $30 to make it whole. It's going to be difficult to come up with an example that, like the one we have in the, in the spreadsheet. Oh, I thought it was because it's your shadow price. Sarah, can you speak in the mic? Sorry, people just call. Yeah, but I'm probably wrong. So Carrie Bentley with the WU Master Power Trading Forum. So your shadow price of your reliability product is zero because your opportunity cost is zero because you wouldn't have been picked up for your energy. Um, but your energy price, is, your energy is $25, right? So then isn't it $25? Yeah, what we want to show so here is that an outcome where you have a physical, energy, a physical uh, resource scheduled in the energy market, but it's not paid adequately just looking at the energy price, all right, because the energy price is set up by another resource, but then because you get that energy also to meet the demand forecast, there's an additional payment for the capacity of reliability, the product that if you add them together, you'll get to the bid price and made it adequate. Now, we have an example in the Excel spreadsheet, and it's difficult to make it up on the board. That example, it took me a while to come up with it. So if you're really interested in that, we can launch that example here and see how that works out. Well, I, I thought Don's simplistic example was trying to illustrate something at a higher level, which was that you, if you and my concern was what you were saying was you could have an energy bid and you might not be fully paid for that in your energy schedule. You would be fully paid for it in your combined energy reliability right. um, uh, schedule. And so that's a, a little bit confusing to me, but it seems like maybe that's an outlier example and not typical because generally you should be paid your opportunity cost, if there is one, or your energy um, offer. Yeah, but so it's hard to come up with an example where you're not paid your energy offer 
plus your opportunity cost. It may be hard to come up with an example, and it took me a while to come up with one, but uh, it can happen. Because what happens here is you have multiple products at multiple prices, so one, uh, when you have one resource uh, giving a, um, having awards that meet different objectives, you get a combination of prices as, uh, as uh, compensation. Since, 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 the physical, since the physical energy is in two constraints, to be bit, to be sufficient, you have to look at those compensation for those two constraints so this to the is, energy. And maybe this is oversimplifying it, and I could be totally off base here. Um, so is that similar to AS nested regions? The the price that's actually paid for example regulation up is a summation of the shadow prices yes. for all the regions it's in, because it can meet all those requirements. And you're only made whole in the aggregate. The last one combined. I'm not sure on the a, if the AS is, would behave in exactly the same way as this, but I think you're, you're getting at the to the extent that you're in multiple that the same, for instance, let's, the same energy is in multiple constraints. Then it's the sum of the multiple constraints that that gets you whole to that energy offer price. Yeah, so, so you're you're summing the shadow prices for all the constraints that it meets. Well. I'm not, I'm not. At a very but high but, level, very yeah, high yeah, level. Sure, okay, I'm summing, them, I'm summing them all up. I think what, I, what I'm trying to say is that you need to look across the, the products that you're nested within, and that's what gets you hold, not individually. So similar effect, and that's what I mentioned earlier. I tried to give a parallel with the ancillary services regional. Um, it's a similar effect, but it, it manifests differently. So here's the example that we had, okay. And in this example, we have two physical generators, one virtual supply, and two physical loads and one virtual demand, okay? And uh, we make sure we make the problem ramp constrained, so we observe the ramp rate for the physical resources, okay? We have bits for energy, and we also have bits for capacity, flexible ramp, and we use these bits also for the reliability capacity. So we clear, uh, I have to use this mouse. So we have energy schedule, that's our initial point. These are four hours in this example. So this is where the energy schedule is clear, and these are the marginal prices. This is the financials of problem. And then we have the reliability schedules for the two physical resources. The clear at this level to meet the demand forecasts. So these are the two objectives. And then we have your capacity awards, which is the difference between the reliability energy schedule and the financial energy schedule. You can see that this resource gets 15 megawatts per capacity up in our four and 15 megawatts back capacity down the first hour because uh, I structured the demand forecast to be lower than what the market clears at the beginning two hours and higher the other hour, so you can see both effects. And you have flexible wrap award requirements, uh, about 40 megawatts up and down, and those clear here for the physical resources. So these are the the marginal prices for the flexible ramp product because of the interaction with the energy and the higher ramp constraints that I had to impose here to have uh, an outcome with uh, ramp constraints. You have high prices in those first two hours where ramp is at a premium. They're reduced here. And if we go to the reliability schedules, you see these are the prices for the reliability energy. So let's go here on this hour. Yeah, there could be. There could be, depending on whether reliability energy clears higher or lower than your energy schedule. So basically, this is the driver. Is the demand forecast clearing, uh, is the demand forecast higher than what the uh, financial energy market clears or lower, right? So if it's higher, you have additional capacity. If it's lower, you need to back down. Um, so we want to see what happens here. You see this $28. 
if you look at the uh, solution, um, let me see the twenty dollars is um, G two bid, and thirty dollars is G one. The, the market clears at twenty eight dollars. Um, However, the first resource has an energy bid of $30, okay? So, scroll up or down? Yeah, the one generator is showing G2. So, this guy here, G2, is bidding $30. It's having a schedule in those last two hours, okay? But it's only pay $28 from the energy market, all right? But if you add the reliability energy payment, it's another $2 here, that brings it whole to $30. So this is what we were trying to do on the board. It's very difficult, trust me, <laughs> to come up with a solution like this. What we wanted to illustrate here is, again, the effect that if you participate and multiple requirements, you meet multiple requirements, you get compensation for each requirement you meet at the marginal price of meeting that requirement. So in this case, G2 provides energy schedule that meets the demand for, that meets the uh, clear demand in the financial sub problem, so you get $28 for that, but then it also meets your demand forecast in the reliability energy, so you get another $2 payment for that, so the total payment is $30 and it's made whole. Uh, Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. So does that I mean your LNP in the day ahead will no longer reflect the marginal offer? Yes, it does, but uh, it does because it on, on, on considering all the commodities together. So you have, um, you have to go back to this equation. this one here, so you can see here that this product here, the energy, financial energy, appears in two constraints, right? And these two constraints have a price sensitivity. So in situations like that, the settlement pays you this sensitivity for whatever clears here, plus that sensitivity for whatever clears here. So that's how you get the combination of prices, and this is similar to the analogy with the regional ancillary services settlement, that you may have contributions towards meeting the regional requirement for ancillary services plus the system. So you get both prices. The same happens with flexible ramp product in real time, because you have uh, potentially a payment for meeting the BAA, your own BAA's requirement for flex for ramp, plus one for meeting the system requirement because they're nested. Okay, so here it's not through nesting, but through still through different equations. Uh, another analogy is through the congestion, transmission congestion. You have a component of the LMP that reflects the marginal congestion, right? That component has subcomponents for its binding constraint. So your energy schedule may be meeting simultaneously multiple transmission constraints. Your marginal congestion component at the LMP at your location reflects contributions from all binding constraints. Again, you have the effect that your energy schedule does multiple things. So you get contributions to your remuneration for the product from all these multiple requirements that you meet. It's the same story told over and over differently, right? Yeah, I, I am not smart enough on the fly to think about the implications of not having your LMP reflect the marginal offer at a particular node. To me, I, I know what you're, I understand what you're saying about AS and how it's the same, but those reflect a little bit different things than your energy signal. Um, I, I think I understand it at least, so thank you. It's been a really helpful for you to go through that spreadsheet, and I know that wasn't easy to do on the fly. 
Um, you're but you're I welcome. Think and, and this is what, what Jeff about. said earlier, that really your energy schedule from a physical resource, it's more than an energy schedule because it's not only meeting your energy balance from the financial market, it provides additional service. It meets your demand forecast. So that's why it has an additional compensation for that. It's different from the pure energy schedule from a virtual resource that only does the first thing. Right? Yeah, but doesn't it blow your mind a little bit that you're providing additional services for a, a low, at a lower price signal? Right, your LMP has decreased even though you're providing more. That's where I'm getting twisted a bit. Um, you may be thinking that way, but it's actually the marginal price because if you go to that spreadsheet, I'm comparing it to today. So today, if you had a sequential and you offered in 30 and then you ran rock, the LMP at that node would be at least 30, and then you would potentially have a rock award on top of it. So I guess the fact that you're integrating the two and the LMP goes down, maybe you could explain that to me intuitively. Yeah, so it's because you have multiple constraints that are binding. So trying to, well, let's go, no, without math, okay? <laughs> let's say that, uh, let's find out what's the cost of serving the next increment of physical load bid at this system. The marginal price is $28, so it says it will cost you $28 to serve one additional megawatt, not of demand forecast, of load cleared with a load bid, okay? And let's see the solution. How would you do that? Um, let's see what capacity is available here. So physical load is scheduled at its maximum because it's at a high price, all right? And the virtual demand is also at $40, so it clears at the maximum, okay? And generator one, which is the cheaper generator, is ramp constrained all the way, ramping up from its initial uh, solution. And it, can go be, it cannot be scheduled more than 190 because it also provides a 10 megawatt, I wanna see flex ramp up, right? Yeah, here it is. So it's a 200 megawatt generator, but 10 megawatt is the optimal solution, the cheaper flex ramp up price that we can get for, for the system because it's bidding it only at $1. The other physical generator bids it at two. So we'll get it from G1. So if I get 10 megawatts for flex ramp up, I only have up to 190 available for energy. Okay, so that's scheduled 190, so you can't get the additional megawatt from here, right? So the only generator that has it available is G2. All right, so G2 is scheduled at 110, right? So if you schedule it at 111, it will give you that additional load of one megawatt. That will cost you $30 though, right? But look what happens. If I make this 111, now I have to also meet a 315 um, physical response. I wanna say that Let's see what else it provides in the fourth hour. It has a 15 megawatt, uh, no, let's go for flexible ramp. So here we are. So it provides also a 30 megawatt flex ramp up, which is the maximum that can provide at its ramp rate. Um, so there is some complex interaction that something else has to change here. And you're gonna make $2. Um, and the easiest way to find that is by changing the solution and rerunning it, but I'm trying to do it on the top of my head. Um, so, oh yes, let's see. Um, so there is a 30 megawatt flexible ramp, so the total capacity commitment is 110 plus 30, 140, right? 
start this ramp feasible. Oh, it's also 30 here. So, so you have from 160 to 140, that's still, oh, that's ramp limited. This can only do 30 megawatts in one 15 minute interval, right? So, capacity schedule here is 130 plus 30, 160. And here is 110 and 30, 140. Not 20 megawatts, it's not ramp constraint. Oh, oh, of course, yeah, what am I saying? Yeah, it's here. So if I make it this 111, all right, then I have to take this one megawatt down, right? Because if I increase the energy schedule, I have to decrease the reliability capacity up, correct? So the reliability energy schedule has to be 125 to meet the 315, all right? But if I make this 111, with 125, this has to go down to 14, correct? The reliability, capacity, the reliability capacity up can only be 14 megawatts because it's going to be 125 minus 111, not minus 110. If I reduce this by one megawatt, this is the rack capacity award. It's valued at the flex per ramp capacity, which is $2 for this resource. So I save $2. So it will cost me $30 in energy, but I will save $2 in capacity. So the marginal cost is $28. So for any other resource in the system, $28 is the price. And for this resource, it's $28, but it's paid the additional $2 for capacity, so it's made whole. So uh, at a, again, at a, I'll go Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. So uh, just to make sure I understood what you just said. So uh, Generator 2 has said they're willing to provide energy at $30 per megawatt hour. They have a flexible ramp up bid for $2. And so they're getting paid for their energy $28, and then they're getting paid $2 for their reliability schedule. Are right. they getting paid for any flex ramp up? Oh, that's a separate payment. Flex ramp up, they're still paid for the 30 megawatts of flexible ramp up. Mm, where is that? Here. They have a 30 megawatt flex ramp up. They're still paid the marginal price for that. That's a separate payment. So they're getting paid $21 on top of that. Yes, but that's for flexible ramp. That's correct. Because the opportunity cost or the marginal cost for providing flex ramp up is $21 here. And if you ask me to tell you why, it will take me another five minutes to figure out. No, no, I, I think that this, this, I'm not trying to get to the specifics. I'm trying to get to what does this do to the LMP and the different prices, and what does that do to incentives? And so I think Don's simple example, and now this more formal walkthrough, is really illuminating on how this will fundamentally change the day ahead market. So it's been really helpful. Which is that, that, and that's, and that's sort of the pro-con discussion you want to have on this is because is doing this, you know, if you, if you think about the other approach, the other approach is going to be they would energy at $3 and we'd have paid $2 for everything else. But this one's a little, a little different. But I mean, isn't, it's Mark Simons at uh, Bonneville, uh, isn't the analogy that the current LMP only values the 28? The current LMP would be 30. Well, $28 is the cost for serving one extra megawatt of load bid at that location, and that's correct. But that's not the price that you need to compensate for that megawatt coming up from G2. That will be $30 because there's an associated $2 capacity price for that. Right, right. That's my point, is that in this formulation, you're doing it this way. In today's world, right, if I'm, un, if I'm understanding today's, correctly, right, you're, you're getting world, that LMP, and then there's some rough payment that's done correct. afterwards. So the side. difference is that the rough payment is incremental. So that $2 capacity that you would have from RAC, it's only paid for that 25 megawatts of reliability capacity as an incremental market. 
But now because we solved the problem altogether, the $2 is paid for the entire 125 megawatts because you're solving it together, right? You co-optimize. Yes. Yeah, Grant McDaniel with Wellhead. So um, <clears throat> because this, you know, <clears throat> as opposed to just the sequential, and this is sort of a practical, I think, pro of, of this approach, that the practical outcome would be that if you had, because you're considering the ramping and uncertainty and you're solving for it all at one time, that the practical result might be that you would have less generation online that can do the same capability because you're solving for all of it at one time because you have to look at the commitment costs as well. Is that true? Can no. Run those? I mean, I no. think that would be a very big pro because then if you have a, a unit that, um, you know, if you had an upgrade on a unit that instead of doing 15 megawatts a minute, now could do 40 megawatts a minute, then it might solve for everything on the reliability, and I would only need one generator instead of two because I'm solving for the entire ramp and uncertainty. Well, look at the example that we had there and we're trying to do on the whiteboard where if we were only solving the IFM sub-problem, you wouldn't need to schedule at all the physical resource. You would have the virtual resource providing everything, right, and then you would have to rack the physical resource. So here you have in the market a solution that says you have the virtual resource scheduled and you have the physical resource also scheduled because they do different things and you have a settlement that makes them both whole for what they provide. Yeah, and I, I think my, my point is I, I think I need to run through some of these examples myself, but I think this actually begins to incentivize, truly incentivize flexibility uh, for resources and, and speed. That is true, but I don't want to say that this is unique to option two. Option one has that too. Once you introduce the Flex Run product, well, you do provide. Uh, you do, uh, but it's sequ sequential, so you might still pick up two units, when in this one, this solution may only pick up one unit. That's an efficiency one. issue, and it's something that can be represented as a pro for option two. Option two yeah. does have efficiency in bringing the two solutions and co-optimizing and solving together. That is undeniably true. I think, I think that's a big plus. So anyway, yeah. just, just thinking out loud. Oh, okay. Is it on the spreadsheet? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, Michelle, we'll go to the question on the phone. Hey, George. This is Mike Castellano from uh, Public Utilities Commission Energy Division. How's it going? Hello, Mike. Uh, so as we're going through all this sort of, um, you know, energy LMP, reliability, capacity, price, and all that, I have a, one thing that I've been thinking about, and I'm not sure how this would work out. Suppose you have a situation with, um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out how energy storage resources might be affected by this uh, market redesign. Um, in particular, it seems like you could have an energy storage resource that, say, bids uh, to sell energy whenever the price is over $35 or whenever it can get over $35 for its energy schedule and buy energy whenever it can buy energy for less than $30. And uh, for the reliability, um, it is a physical resource, so I assume it would qualify for that, but it's going to be bidding in either way, so it just bid zero for the reliability and for ramp. And it seems like you could have a situation. Did you say zero? Yeah. Bid FRP at zero. Oh, FRP at zero, okay. Yeah. So then you could have a situation um, okay, go on. Say, you could have um, the energy LMP at, say, 28 or 29, say 29, uh, and then $7 for reliability capacity. So then this resource is... So that means it should be scheduled to, to generate. Right. So if that's the situation, then it will be scheduled to generate. But it wants to buy when it can buy energy. Because you will get a total of 30, what, 36 for the $35 bid, right? Yeah, but it could buy for 29 on its $30 bid. Um, the buy price is at 30 um, but if you're buying, you have to um, you have a reliability capacity down potentially. Um, that depends whether that price is positive or negative. So 
To answer your question, Mike, I think it all depends on how the uh, bids and the optimal prices are going to clear here. So okay, in the fact that the storage resource is a physical resource, it's not... George, what I'm concerned about is that we could end up with a situation where that kind of resource is going to be economic in either direction and um, could be just sort of dispatched back and forth, or not dispatched, but could get a day ahead schedule sort of back and forth um, kind of arbitrarily. And I, I arbitrarily, you're saying? Um, arbitrarily, but it's good, they're going to be, it's not going to be as closely related to the express bids of the resource or a sort of, you know, logical format that I'd expect there as, you know, we would like to see. And we're already having problems with those kind of resources okay, so really participating in the market. I think so you're saying that the market outcomes should be such that this resource could be optimal either generating or consuming. And you see an issue hunting between those two approaches, between these two operation modes? Yeah, and I think that, you know, that essentially relates to, uh, you know, back in the old days when I worked at DMM, I think we raised the concern that this kind of design really does lead to a difference between the price of generation and the price of load, and that is um, disconcerting okay. from a sort of overall market well, point. We'll have to see an example, Mike, to um, to analyze the case that you're um, you're um, thinking about. I, I don't know how and if it will play out. Um, I just see it as a physical resource. It's uh, it's not load, so it's like a generator that can go positive or negative. So for me, I don't see the significance of the fact that you can have energy consumption. It's just an algebraic injection on the grid that has a monotonically increasing energy bid. I don't see that different than any other generator, but uh, if you can uh, show us what you're, um, what you're uh, afraid of, with an example, we'll analyze it. All right, thanks, George. Mike? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that will be interesting to see. Any other questions? Roy, do we have anybody else in the queue? We have no further questions on the phone at this time. Great, thank you. So let's go back and let's go back to the presentation and conclude it so that we can. Um, I think it's this one, and we were here. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> oh, I, add, I added this slide on the flight. Then, well, then I can skip it on the flight. All right. So, <laughs> um, so the the last slide I wanted to present here was the cost allocation scheme that we uh, proposed as a as starters here. Um, so we have three kinds of costs for those three capacity products, right? We have the flex ramp up cost for the procurement of flex ramp. We have flex ramp down cost for the procurement of flex ramp down, and then we have the reliability. Uh, cost where we compensate, we pay for the reliability energy that marginal price of the reliability power balance constraint. So this is a proposal of how we can allocate this cost, and this is uh, uh, very similar to how we allocate rack costs today on a two-tier allocation. So for flex wrap up cost and the reliability cost, because they're both in the upper direction going upward, so it's the same cost allocation. We propose to allocate this in proportion to net negative demand deviation plus net virtual supply, okay? So it's the same like rack cost today. Um, that's in the first year, so we limit that to an average flex ramp up cost rate. Um, and then any remaining cost goes to meter demand. And for the flex ramp down, it's the reverse allocation determinant that goes in proportion to net positive demand deviation plus net virtual demand up to an average rate. And then the remaining on tier two uh, in proportion to meter demand. So basically this kind tries to reflect cost causation, what we did for the rack costs. Right? 
So if you have a net negative demand deviation in your portfolio, then you're contributing to reasons that we want to procure flex for ramp up. So you need to pick up the cost. The same with virtual supply. If you have virtual supply, we have to replace it in real time with, with physical supply, and therefore we need to procure flex for ramp up for it. So you need to pick up some portion of that cost. And the same works for flex for ramp down. So let's see if you have any questions on this. And then we move to the next portion. Yes. That's Dan from CES. I don't know if it's a question on this, but would, would you set ancillary service procurement targets on, I guess, the top line from whatever it was, slide 16 or slide 18, or are you setting ancillary service targets just on your forecasted demand? So like, are, does your, do you set spin and non-spin and regulation on the full procurement right. target at the very so top? So the there's no proposal in the day ahead market enhancements to, at least at this point, to change the way we calculate ancillary services requirements. Um, these are based on, uh, for the contingency reserves, they're based on their criteria, okay? And it's 3% load plus 3% generation, unless you have a higher value for your larger single contingency. So yeah. that's when we say generation and load, these are all forecasted, uh, not where the market clears. And for regulation, there is a variable number that reflects the ramp needs in the system, and so it's different at different parts of the day. Uh, we don't propose to change those as part of the day ahead market enhancement. Yeah, this is on, and we don't we don't really buy like think of buying AS as like in addition to the energy that cleared the day ahead market. We set a specific requirement for it, and you meet that requirement. And then at a resource level, you have to make sure that when anyone who's awarded AS energy that they have both the capacity and the ramp capability to deliver both services simultaneously. Good. I may have been misreading some of the price performance analysis, but I thought that there was some feedback loop um, with, uh, I can't remember if it was with Ruck or with just some of the forecasted days where there was like over forecasted load led to higher AS, which then kind of had a feedback loop on pricing. and. I just didn't know if there was going to be a, a feedback loop between the procurement of FR, FRU, of RCU, and... No, I mean, I, so I think what, you, what you're really highlighting there is the fact that we don't re-optimize AS in the real-time market. So what we, what we do is we procure 100% of what the forecast to need is in day ahead, and if we bought too much, we just keep it. We don't release it and let it go into the market as energy. Okay, so the so the procurement target is still going to be that demand forecast from not including our AS procurement targets. We it's a little different because you don't really know how much you have until you clear the market. So we just pick basically six percent of load and say that's what we want to clear to because we don't know where the interties will necessarily necessarily clear. Okay. Any other question? Roy, do we have any questions on the phone? We have no questions at this time. So, uh, Mark Simons at Bonneville, going back to the slide you were just on. George, can you talk a little bit more about the average cost rates for FRU and FRD? Oh, yeah, okay. So, let's say you procure uh, 100 megawatts of flex ramp up. And the uh, clear price for this, let's say it's $2. So, let's say, you know, you spend $200 procuring the product. And then you go to your allocation basis, and you say um, your allocation determinant is uh, 50 megawatts. So let's say your net virtual supply, your net negative demand deviation, they add up to 50 megawatts. All right? Uh, we don't want you to... Um, so, so that says that, you know, if you have to pick up a cost in, um, in proportion to your 50 megawatts, okay? Uh, but let's say you're the only scheduling coordinator that had this allocation determined. We don't want you to pick up all the $200 because the $200 cost was for 100 megawatts of the product and your uh, allocation basis is only 50 megawatts. So we say, okay, there is a rate that we're gonna cap the allocation. You're only gonna pick up uh, the cost that goes for your 50 megawatts 
of, of allocation. If 50 megawatts is half of the 100 megawatts we would procure, so you pick up only $100. The rest of the $100 will go to the tier two. So that's how the tiered allocation works. There is, there is a cap to how much cost will be allocated based on your allocation determinant that we don't want to give you allocate more cost that comes on a megawatt per megawatt basis with what we procure for the product. And if you look at the uh, formulas that I have in the technical uh, document, you will see how this rate is actually calculated all, um, you know, with equations, which I didn't include here. I think you had enough equations. Okay, so this is where you can pick up the solvers. And Don will do the discussion. Maybe I don't. Know. Do, do you need a break, Don, or do you well, guys think, need a break? Well, I, I think the key thing we have here is sort of a time check in terms of what people would like us to review. We're actually a little bit over time relative to what we had on the agenda. Um, I do think that, uh, like I said, I think from a pros con standpoint, I think it, we've sort of touched on them type stuff. But I think now that you have a better understanding of how both approaches work, you know, I think it'll be more beneficial to have that discussion at the MSC. So the question is. We have the deliverability constraints, but those are common between the two approaches. Do we need to review those now, or should we talk about the analysis? Because some of the analysis may feed into which approach you take to, and so should we just touch on that and then call it a, call it a day? So up for people's thoughts. He asked, he asked, he asked whether you want more equations. <laughs> so we have one, one, one vote for the analysis. Yeah, I, I think this, Yeah, you could, we more than happy to do more questions, too. I think it'd be good to focus on the analysis because, yeah. you know, because that way we can get, we'll uh, get some feedback so we can get started on it. Yeah, so let's, yeah. let's, let's finish up with some questions with regards to the two formulations and, and then, then we'll end it with the, uh, the analysis that we're looking at doing. Uh, Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Training Forum, and I apologize, these are more like general topics that I just would like you to talk about because it's just so helpful when you talk. Um, something I didn't think I'd say to you, John, that often. <laughs> We're spending years sitting next to you. Um, we also so, have uh, available. <laughs> um, so uh, two topics. One, I thought it was really interesting when you started to kind of go into the pro or cons and talked about the role of virtual supply and virtuals in both of them. So I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that. And then uh, two, the second topic is the impact on CRRs. I'm trying to figure out if you have this new um, LMP and you really have decoupled the, the oh, maybe a three, at the, the um, cost of the nodes from the offers, you're now changing the congestion component of the LMP, which impacts the CRR market. Um, so I, I, again, am not smart enough on the fly to think about how you've impacted the CRR market, but it'd be interesting to hear about. And then three, um, how, this is Callie's question, um, how uh, will this change the DLAP prices? So I think you just showed us what the prices would be at the generator nodes, but from um, the DLAPs, how, what will the price be for energy? That last one is easy. It's the same price that the virtual supply and demand will see. So it's the pure energy price, the that $28, $28 you saw. Yeah. 20, the tw like in the example, it would have been the 28 Because that's the energy right. price. Because the bid, in, the bid in demand can't meet the reliability schedule. So of course that's, that's correct. Go Sorry, this is Kai. So just, I'm just kind of comparing it today. So today's world, it would be 30 Tomorrow's world, it would be 28. Okay. Well, you can't really compare the two well, because it's, it's today's the world doesn't the have the product. The price load no, I think what you're, what you're saying is under under option one, it would be 30. Under option two, it would be 28. Is a better yeah, way to say versus com, don't, don't, I wouldn't compare it to okay. today, today because okay. we don't have FRP. But between the two options, that's correct. Okay. So, so, you're, so on the on the virtuals, so are you, you know, if you look at what the role of them are today in the current market, they're there. You know, you have virtual supply there to, uh, to the extent that there's under scheduling of generation that you would expect the virtual supply to come in because it's then profitable for them when the supply shows up in real time, 
and then virtual demand is there to ensure that there's sufficient or that bid and load isn't trying to bid super low, so they set a low price for a big chunk of their of their uh, um, demand, but then wait till real time to get them to to pick up the higher priced resources. So I think they're putting that tension on there. And the question comes when you don't have that tight couple tight linkage to where there's one settled at in their example in the combined where now the virtual settled at 28 and the physical settled at 28 plus two, are you having that, that are virtuals performing the same function that they were? Uh, and if we change that function and, and if we have, what does that, what are the, what does that mean? So I don't have the answers on that. I think it's just one of the things we need to think about when we look at the two options. And then CRRs, you might have to help me on this one too, George, but I, but I think on the CRRs you would take the congestion components associated with the energy schedule constraint only, not the reliability energy schedules. That's correct. So we don't, we don't see any impact on CRRs. We still use the marginal contribution component of the energy LMP. So in the two options, 30 versus 28. So there is, between the two options, there is a difference in the CRRs. The solutions are different. Okay. So the CRRs still provide a hedge for congestion as materialized in the financial energy market, but the prices between option one and option two will be different because you're solving different problems. We're not going to reflect the capacity, reliability capacity products in the CRR. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so we don't see an impact on CRRs. Are there any questions on the phone? There are no questions on the phone at this time. Mark? Can uh, it doesn't have a slide number, but one of the things that it says needs to analyze and understand uncertainty between day ahead and real-time markets, one of the questions at the bottom is does the product need to meet FMM or RTD uncertainty? Yeah, and I guess I was curious, right? I mean, isn't the whole intent of the product to meet the uncertainty into the FMM and then the next product meets uncertainty into the RTD? That's, that's correct. The question is, if you think about, you know, you want to have sufficient economic bids coming into the full real-time market, do you need economic bids to cover not just your uncertainty that materializes in FMM, but the uncertainty that could materialize after FMM? And I think we're coming to the conclusion that you don't. You just, they're two distinct products and you buy to get to FMM with one and then you buy to get to RTD uh, with the other product. Right. I think I think that's the way that we were understanding it, and one of the reasons why, you know, we think that this is a really good uh, enhancement to consider for the day ahead and help to be able to pre-position resources that are capable of doing these types of things, but might have financial incentives to provide a different product in the market today than maybe what uh, this type of a product or maybe what this type of products more than one could incent us to do. So it's really valuable to have this conversation and continue to carry it forward. Any other questions in the room or on the phone? All right, this is Megan Pogue again with the ISO and we'll briefly talk about some of the data analysis. And I've taken a couple notes on specific analysis, so let me recap that first and then hit the slides um, that we've got. So in relation to the 15-minute ramp um, between the intervals, the data request to basically to figure out how frequently is that happening and what's the magnitude of that. Um, and then in relation to net load uncertainty, we talked about 
not only determining the amount of uncertainty, but what is the breakdown of the uncertainty. So is it load uncertainty, is it renewable uncertainty, um, and then also the correlation of self-schedules into the real-time market that's creating inflexibility. So those were the specific data requests I noted from um, this morning's discussion. Was there anything else that we discussed that I did not capture? Okay, good. Um, and I think that it's beneficial to start with those because I know we could ask for a million data requests and Guillermo's team would probably kill us. <laughs> so when we're doing these data requests, I think it's important to understand why we're asking for the data. Data's interesting, I've got an engineering background, I love data, but when it comes down to it, we have to understand what's the objective of it, what's the purpose, how is it driving the decision we're trying to make. So when we've been brainstorming some of the data we can do, it should be driving um, what market formulation we're doing as well as how do we determine the requirements, which we, once we know which market formulation we're going with, how do we determine how much of this new product do we need? Um, so I've got here the reminder of what uncertainty is and it's that need for dispatchable generation um, to meet any changes in net load. And as we've been thinking through this, I think there are, are two objectives for our data analysis. So the first would be to advise what market formulation we go with and this gets to Don points, um, Don's point of earlier, and I know we talked about uh, market participant error not being the correct term, but are, are we determining that the KISO net load forecast is more accurate and we should be using that as the set point for our requirement, or is there more accuracy with um, what is clearing in the IFM? So is it the forecast, KISO's forecast or what is clearing um, in the integrated forward market. So that type of data should be driving the market formulation decision. And then the other set of data would be determining our procurement target. So once we know what formulation we have, um, how much of this new product do we need to get? So I'm going to skip over this slide. You guys have seen this before. Um, a couple ideas that we have with this. So again, just to recap briefly, on the left we have the KISO's demand forecast coming out of RUC in comparison to our 15-minute market. And this is the uncertainty that's materializing between those two runs. On the right we have um, integrated forward market, so what's clearing in the IFM in comparison to FMM. We're trying to figure out which one has more or less uncertainty. One thing that I think would be beneficial that I'd like to do is almost overlay these. It's one thing to look at them side by side, but to actually look at them on top of each other, and I know that that would look like a lot of data, so if we can figure out a way to graphically understand that and figure out, you know, if we're really looking for the outliers, what is the comparison of the outliers? If we're trying to just get, check the averages, um, what does that look like? So that's something I'd like to do as well. But in addition to that, um, Something else we can do. Christina, do you know how to get rid of this little box? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is we have various market runs within the day ahead and the real time frame. So we know we've got the day ahead market consisting today of the integrated forward market, the residual unit commitment, and something we've been talking about is the bias that occurs in the residual unit commitment. And the technical term for that is RUC net short. It's our operator's way to go in and say they don't think the KISO forecast is enough, and so they can increase the KISO demand forecast so the residual unit commitment clears higher than it would have without that rough net short process. So if we compare those to real time, we have a lot of different options. We can compare IFM to FMM. We can compare IFM to RTD. We can compare regular RUC without the bias to FMM and RTD. And then we can also consider the operator bias, the RUC net short from FMM um, or to FMM as well as the RUC net short to RTD. And one of the questions we talked about earlier is do we really need to be solving this problem in a day ahead? or can we leave this problem of uncertainty and ramp feasibility to real time? And one of the things I've been grappling with is the impact of the operator actions. And if we're taking operator actions, I think there is a case to be made that we should be incorporating those manual operator actions into a more efficient overall cost-effective day-ahead market solution. And I think potentially, and this is just me speaking on the fly, but a way we could do that is to compare what the IFM cleared at without RUC, with without a bias to either FMM, or actually maybe just to FMM, but to FMM or RTD, 
And then let's take what the operator did, which would be RuckNet short, and in my mind, any EDs that occurred as well. So if we take RuckNet short and compare, that's what the operator thinks is going to happen, then let's compare that to FMM. And we see if what the operator thought would happen, let's say the operator throws in a 1,500 megawatt bias into RUC on a hot summer day, and then they ED 1,000 um, megawatts on top of that. So you've got 2,500 megawatts that the operator thought they needed. Well, if we compare that to what happened between IFM and FMM, did that 2,500 megawatts actually materialize? So I think that might, uh, there's probably some details we'll have to work through, but that might be an approach to get towards, is the operator action actually material? Materializing, and if it is, I think that would justify the need to be having some type of product um, that we can consider that in the day ahead market. Um, and that's all getting towards, you know, determining how much uncertainty we have between the day ahead and the real time market, which should drive the need to have this product at all. Um, so with that, I, I would like to ask for any other specific data requests or ideas um, right now. Also. Feel free to think about it, but when you're putting the com or request, the data request in your comments, my ask of you is to explain what's that driving. What's the reason behind the data request? Um, it does take our data team a long time to pull and analyze these requests. Um, we want them to be informative, so keep that in mind when you're asking for data requests. Yes. I just wanted to add the way you just formulated that that analytical uh, postulation for what you're going to compare between what the IFM alone would do versus what the IFM and all the other actions uh, would do is important in two, two ways. One, I think you were emphasizing the volume and the need aspect of that, but also those are real costs incurred today. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the sum of those real costs incurred today that would ultimately be compared with whatever this, this solution is, right? Yeah, um, good point. So both the cost perspective as well as the, the need perspective. Um, yeah, so potentially the commitment costs that come out of RUC plus the cost of the EDs. That, that's right, because, I mean, our, our thinking, right, is, is that these, some of these products should uh, mitigate the amount of out-of-market actions that are required. So. And inefficiently, right? That's we have. Well, it, it would mitigate the need to do them in the first place, and then in the second place, it would it would create a more efficient way to yes. get them get them accomplished. Um, that that's at least the thinking. And so, if we knew the total uh, pie, both from a need perspective and a cost perspective, we were thinking that would be illustrative to this. Thanks. This is Brad Cooper. So I just note, though, and this has come up in some recent stakeholder meetings, we don't think the right metric is necessarily lower cost compared to the, to the, to the, to today. You know, what we think the we think the right metric is is the right cost. You know, so for example, to the extent we're relying, relying on capacity today that we're not compensating. Uh, to a market clearing price, it's economically it's more efficient to be paying uh, that that price to generators. And in, in, the, in the long run, that's going to be the cheapest solution. But with, if we're comparing out of market pay as bid prices to uh, individual generators, those costs to a market clearing price for some capacity, the overall cost of the market for for the for the capacity payments is likely to be higher. Just like. You know, the, the, the IFM, if we, if we paid every generator as bid, you know, in the short run, it'd be a, it'd be a cheaper cost. It, it probably wouldn't in the long run. But my point is, is you know, we're we're trying to find the the, the right price, the, the the right cost, which isn't necessarily the, the lowest cost. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, Dan from CES. It's not an analysis request, but I guess more of a synthesis and qualitative requests, just, you know, we have a meeting tomorrow morning on the price performance analysis and some of the initial stuff that came out of there, um, and we didn't discuss that here today, and I don't see a discussion of DAME in the slides for uh, the price performance tomorrow, and so maybe just requesting that it's the MSC or the next go-around that we start to try and tie some of those things together and 
I, I don't know, I guess like Carrie was asking, it's we learn things when you talk, so even if it's just a qualitative thing of talking through some of the examples that show up in the price performance analysis of how you know, you and Don and George, when you read through some of those example days that look problematic, you know, how do you expect it to be better or different or those sorts of things? Um, and then just checking for uh, maybe, you know, consistency in how you talk about the your, your slide previous to this versus then, like, the uncertainty metrics that are showing up in the price performance analysis. So we make sure we're talking about the same thing when we're looking at sort of different numbers that are coming out in different areas. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Roy, do we have anybody on the phone? We do have a few questions over the phone. Okay. Caller, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi there. It's Mark Holman with PowerX. Just a, a couple of thoughts. First, really uh, agree with Brad Cooper's comments just a moment ago. Um, I, I think really it's critically important that when we're examining price and costs, we're looking for the right price or the more the most efficient price. It's always going to be lower total costs, as Brad points out, to have out-of-market actions that give side payments when you have a centralized market with it, with a effectively a central buyer procuring all the products. Um, so it's really important when we look at these things, we look at is it improving the efficiency of dispatch and is it procuring all of the grid's needs in the most efficient way through a co-optimized market solution. Um, just to, to the comment you may make, it's just one way to think about some of this data analysis is um, when you're talking about analyzing whether those market, market operator actions such as ruck net short, whether those actually materialized. When I think about that, that I, I think materialized is how we measure that because if we think about, for example, spinning reserve or non-spinning reserve, contingencies don't materialize most of the time but you still procure that capacity through the market solution to carry flexible capacity to respond to defined contingency events. And I, I think the gap that exists today um, is that some of the ruck that's being procured and the ruck net short and the exceptional dispatch and the load biasing that we're seeing is, re is really operators acquiring flexible capacity to have in case they, they do get a condition that's, you know, a P9, you know, one of the one of the tail conditions within reason. So I think when we do the data analysis, the way I think about, you know, the, the integrated solution that you're looking at and incorporating ROC is really saying instead of using ROC and exceptional dispatch and load biasing and these other tools to buy an additional flexible capacity bucket that's not currently being purchased in the market, so in the market today, there's spinning reserve, there's non-spinning reserve, and there's regulating reserve, but we have this other net load variations and uncertainty, which is often talked about loosely as balancing reserve, that's being procured through various out-of-market actions. And how do we do the analysis to say how much of that is a reasonable quantity to procure to meet, is it a P95 level? of variations and uncertainty, and then doing that efficiently through the market solution. But it's not about whether it was needed to be deployed, because that is reserved to cover a range of conditions at some defined level. And if you're setting aside spinning reserve, non-spinning reserve, regulating reserve, or this new flexible ramping product, you shouldn't be expecting it to be deployed. And the same thing with RuckNet Short, the current out-of-market solution, you may be carrying headroom to cover a, a high net load event with a reasonably high degree of confidence. So just, just some thoughts around how the, maybe to do the data analysis is saying how much should be carried. Actually, that's an interesting point, Mark, and I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, I think the reason I was coming up with ideas of how to quantify the magnitude of this is just based on the discussion we had earlier, is that are we, do we need to be solving this problem in the day ahead market? And I think to the point that you and I both agree on is from a market efficiency perspective, getting our operator out of market actions into the market. I, I see that that's not a question that there is value in that, but is there a way that we should or need to quantify that? And if so, what would that data analysis look like? So I guess can I ask you your personal opinion? Do you think that that is something we can just roll with and assume that, yes, market efficiency, um, taking out of market or operator actions and putting those into the market is always the correct action, or should we be keeping this, just forget about keeping it in the day ahead market or 
keep putting it in the day ahead and let real time solve it. I think the general I think the the, the general uh, principle should be that that out of market actions we want to minimize and avoid. Now you'll never get any grid, whether it's an organized market, a bilateral market, a standalone BA that doesn't have to do something in extreme circumstances. But I think some of these actions that we're seeing, you know, rock net short, exceptional dispatch, load biasing, those are regular actions that are occurring quite frequently. These are not, you know, we had something extreme and extraordinary happen in a load pocket. These are ongoing every day of various levels and various hours with, you know, patterns in the evening peak of load biasing, of exceptional dispatch on hot days. These are clearly things that the grid needs on an ongoing basis. And I think the general rule should be we shouldn't be doing anything out of market that can be avoided through appropriate procurement. And um, out of market should be that rare circumstance where, hey, if I've got something that happens only under very rare conditions a couple times a year, do I want to go and enhance my market and spend a bunch of time and money to build tools to bring that into the market? But when I look at things like RuckNet short, I look at exceptional dispatch, load biasing, those are regular things that are occurring with systemic patterns behind them. And really one of the key drivers appears to be that there's an additional need for flexible capacity as more bears have integrated onto the grid that's not covered through contingency reserves and regulating reserves, and the operators are understandably, when they're put in that position, using the tools they have in the toolbox to create that upward headroom, whether it's getting additional imports, you know, whether it's through RuckNet short or exceptional dispatch, they need that extra headroom to cover that uncertainty. That type of, of action that's regular or ongoing to us clearly needs to be something that needs to be procured through the market, and it needs to be co-optimized in the procurement so that you do get an efficient dispatch, which resources are carrying which product, resources are positioned ahead of time so that you have the full fleet, you're not waiting till real time where you have a, a lower pool of resources to acquire those products, and you're appropriately pricing each of the different products that the grids need. And I think it's this one a big bucket of kind of balancing reserves that these different out of market actions are really driving towards because we don't yet have that that day ahead flexible ramping product and that that um, that r u c product where there's capacity and flexible capacity in the right amounts of each to be set aside to cover that net load uncertainty and movement hey mark this this is brad uh, so Back to the analysis, so I, I think what you're saying is when we're looking at differences between uh, uh, what what the IFM cleared and what the ramping needs that actually happened in real time are is that we, we shouldn't be looking at average differences because on average you might not need all the capacity. We should, I think you were saying we should be looking at like the the, the P95 differences, and that's, yeah, that's I how we quantify the I think, you're exactly, the averages. I think you're exactly right, Brad. I think you don't, you know, you don't want to be looking at a P99.9. .9. You need to decide, well, what's, what's the, you know, the way I think about it is what's the level, what's the reasonable level of balancing reserves or flexible capacity that an operator is comfortable carrying in the upward and downward direction to deal with net load uncertainty and variations, and maybe that's a P95. And so you say, well, what is the, let's calculate what the P95 is from the P50 market solution. How much would that be? How much is that roughly what the operators are, are, are achieving through these different tools? And if they're achieving more than that, then maybe you've got to look at the P95 right, or is it maybe if we had this set aside and had, had further dialogue and processes with the operators, you kind of got to look at that, that metric and say, what's the right level to carry? Is that the level that they're procuring? Um, and then figure out between those two data points. So, for example, if your P95 ends up being 2,000 megawatts of upward capacity and the operators, you know, regularly creating 2,500 megawatts of upward headroom on the system, you look at those two numbers and say, well, what is the right metric that we should be using for integrating that product into the market solution? I like it, Mark. I, I'm thinking maybe what we could do is start with that bias amount, add the bias amount plus the ruck net, or the I'm sorry, the bias plus the ED, and then maybe compare that to the P90, P95, P100 uncertainty, um, and see what that looks like. And doing various, you know, or maybe even down to P50, but do various 
levels and see what it looks like. And see what it looks like, and that might give some insights in terms of what you may want to, want to be doing in terms of establishing how much needs to be carried so that, because I think there's two things. One, one to procure it efficiently, procure it ahead of time from the full pool, pool of resources is more efficient, but also helping get rid of those operator actions and allowing it to happen through the market solution is more efficient. So ideally it would be great if those numbers converged. If you found that the, the market, that if you said, hey, P95 seems to be the right level, and that just happens to be the level of operator intervention uh, caused headroom we're getting, then hopefully that leads you to a solution of procuring that to find quantity to uh, minimize those, those interventions at the same time. Thank you, that's helpful. Thanks. Roy, we have another question in the queue. Yes, yeah, moving on to our next question. Caller, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Lindsay Slickway from NV Energy. Um, I don't really have, um, I guess, a, a certain analysis that I'm asking for, but one of the concerns I have is more of a question on, um, well, okay, so one of the concerns I have is that if we procure all of this capacity in the day ahead market, then is it possible that the real-time market will re-optimize and kind of unwind all of the capacity that has been kind of set aside for to handle the extreme ramps in real time? And so I was kind of wondering um, if you think that will be the case, since there won't be any changes in real time? Can you explain what you mean by unwind? Um, yes, so if, say, okay, so you you have your unit commitment in such a way that you have the amount of ramp needed uh, to meet the requirement in day ahead, but then once you get into real time and it's, it re-optimizes everything in the, in the stuck run and, and um, in the RTPD runs, I'm wondering if that will sort of, I guess, decommit units or change the commitment levels such that it doesn't provide the ramp that's needed if this has been set aside for? It shouldn't because even if FMM does re-optimize and uh, pulls a unit offline that had been committed in the day ahead time frame, um, we still have 15 minute ramp constraints within FMM. So at that point, you still would be able to meet your 15 minute ramping needs between intervals. So I can't imagine there being a scenario where the real time market could unwind um, the, what we procure and do in the day ahead market with this new product. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for answering the question. That's all I had. Roy, do we have any other questions in the queue? We have no further questions in the queue. Okay. This is Sarah Eaton with Bonneville. Um, just in the context of informing that pro-con decision, we're thinking it might be useful to see that cost allocation settlement piece done as a worked example like you did with the solver worksheet. Is that something you guys could do? So that's a little difficult because that allocation of the terminal um, involves load deviation, so you have to have meter. Uh, it's a lot more data than what is in the solver. That's basically just schedules and bids. So it's it's not easy to do it in that format. Maybe we can do something different. Something else. Yeah, just to see kind of a worked example, because yeah. I know you're saying it would be almost prorated on the participation of the resource, so it would just be interesting to see that explicitly written out. Yeah, I, you know, I think okay. the settlement example. Yeah, know, that would be great. Thank you. Just because, I mean, we could do a settlement example separate from the various solvers. Just yeah. All right, so last thing, and I'll go over this really quickly. You guys have been troopers today. I know this is a long meeting. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about the proposed schedule is because we are coming up with a new concept that we will be going forward with for our board approval and EIM governing body approval with this initiative. So historically, when we do a policy initiative, we work with you all. We develop an issue paper, a straw proposal. We end up with a draft final proposal, and at that time, we take it to the 
IAEA, I'm governing body and the ISO board for their approval. It's then after that that we typically do our draft tariff and our BRS um, requirements. What we've realized, especially with an initiative this big, is it may be prudent and beneficial to do the BRS and the draft tariff before we go to the board. So that if we develop a business requirement and realize that that's going to impact the policy or vice versa, that we can actually go back to the policy and make updates as needed before we take it to the board. Um, so this is a somewhat new process, and you'll notice in here we've got the draft final proposal, which we're targeting to complete in February 2020, then we'll spend the next two quarters working on the BRS and the draft tariff, and we'll actually come up with a final proposal. Instead of a draft final proposal, we'll have a final proposal with the BRS and draft tariff as appendices to that proposal, so when we go to the board, we have the entire package. We've heard um, from the Department of Market Monitoring, from stakeholders, you know, well, what are the implementation details and impacts, and typically from a policy perspective, we can't opine on that, and we think this is a better process to get us in that direction. Direction. So the policy process will be a little bit longer, um, but this also should make sure we're on target for our implementation date. And when we go to the board, um, we would not anticipate any changes coming out of the BRS uh, process, tariff process. So just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of this change. Um, and with that, please submit comments on this. Um, we will be asking for input on the market formulations. We have a comments template that we're publishing on the website. So please use the comments template. That will be up shortly, um, hopefully tomorrow, and submit comments by July 11th. We left an extra week because 4th of July. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Mark Simons at Bonneville. I just wonder, uh, with the level of questions and dialogue that took place here today, if you guys were thinking about having some additional uh, together time one way or another, virtually or in person, prior to the market surveillance committee meeting no. or not? You know, maybe since we never did get to the deliverability, we could think about scheduling another one. Of these. Schedule one more. Or we could all stay uh, another two hours and George could go over the deliverability. So, so Mark, I, I, Mark, actually, that is sort of an interesting idea. I mean, I think after we get people's comments and stuff on the 11th to maybe have a, a call uh, where we can chat through it, because I, I, do, I do want the MSC to be a, a really good discussion of pros and cons and everybody understanding the issues. Um, and so it might be beneficial after we get your guys' comments on the 11th and have a few days to digest them to maybe have a conference call where we can sort of maybe even, to the extent that hopefully you'll start documenting some of the pros and cons in there and maybe we could even have a, a draft of, of what we've collectively identified as the pros and cons and review that after in there. Yeah, agreed. That's along the lines of what I was thinking. Thanks, Tom. Do we have any questions on the phone, Roy? We have no questions at this time. We do. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. We really appreciate the discussion. Uh, we look forward to your comments on the 11th. Again, we'll be posting the uh, template, hopefully, by end of day tomorrow. So thank you. Travel, travel safely home.